Chapter 171, Yule Ball, The Start. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon at eva.patreon.com slash fictiononlyreader. The link is also in the synopsis. The Ravenclaw common room looked strange, full of people wearing different colors instead of the usual mass of black. School robes could only be customized so much. As such, party robes and dresses showed each student's unique charm. Terry Boot looked Eddie from top down and spoke in an unconvinced tone. I still can't work out how you got one of the best-looking girls in the year. Eddie put his hands into the pant pockets and answered suavely, Animal magnetism. Marcus, who was talking to Michael Corner, turned and scoffed, more like a bashful request. Marcus felt a tap on his shoulder and turned to see his lovely date standing behind him. Luna Lovegood looked very pretty indeed, in robes of shocking yellow, with her blonde plate braided with white flowers, white ribbons wrapped prettily around her hands, and silver satin gloves gracing her hands. She was glowing. You look pretty. Thank you. You are looking pretty as well. Marcus reached into his robes and pulled out a wrist corsage with three white roses and numerous faux pearls. This is for you. I thought it would look good with your dress. Luna presented her wrist. Marcus understood it immediately and gently clipped it around her wrist. The girl looked at her wrist for seconds, raised it near her face to take in the scent of roses preserved with a special potion to keep the freshness and enhance the fragrance. She looked up at Marcus with a smile in her dreamy eyes. Thank you, it's beautiful. I think it's you who makes it look even more beautiful. By the side, Eddie, Terry, and Michael stared at the scene between the two. Eddie clicked his tongue and commented, Normally, he doesn't speak much, but now look, he's spouting flowers out of his mouth. Did you bring something like that? asked Terry. Michael shook his head. He's making us look bad. Marcus and Luna joined the boys, with Luna asking, I don't see Quinn. Where's he? Eddie pointed towards a corner of the common room. Everyone looked towards the corner to see Quinn surrounded by a horde of Ravenclaw girls, all giggling while Quinn smiled all the way while talking with them. What's he doing there? inquired Luna. Don't know, they were suddenly all over him, replied Eddie shrugging. Eventually, the crowd of giggling girls dissipated, with Quinn waving them all off while making his towards them. Luna, now don't you look pretty, said Quinn with a beaming smile on his face. He looked at the guys and nodded. Looking good, fellas, ready to party hard? Do you have an after-party planned? asked Michael. Quinn shook his head. No, I was a bit too busy to organize an after-party, but I can get you inside the Weasley Twins after-party. You'll just have to pay a reasonable token entry fee. Why don't we know about this party? How do you know that? It's a very exclusive thing. They don't want just anyone to come in. But if you take my name, they'll let you in. It will be even better if you guys take your dates with you. A better gender ratio always helps. Quinn's name held weight in the Weasley twins' world. He had a long history of cooperation with them, plus he was their future angel investor for their business. We should get going, said Quinn, checking his pocket watch, looking pretty happy about using it. The entrance hall was packed with students too, all milling around, waiting for eight o'clock, when the doors to the great hall would be thrown open. Those people who were meeting partners from different houses were edging through the crowd, trying to find one another. Tracy arrived the same time they did, and called out to Eddie when in earshot. The slightly nervous boy turned to be stunned out of his mind as Tracy Davis, his date, walked towards him in a dress of royal blue and turquoise. She had tied her hair in a messy bun with an ornate glass hair stick. Hi, she said. Ha, hi. That was all Eddie could get out. Quinn leaned to mutter into Marcus's ear. It's so entertaining to see him like this. He's usually all attack. I knew he'd be weak to attacks. I don't think Tracy has done anything, though I see what attack you're talking about. I know. Imagine if she did go on attack, cackled Quinn. If Tracy wanted, she could have him wrapped around her finger by the end of the day. A group of Slytherins came up the steps from the dungeons. Malfoy was in front. He was wearing dress robes of black velvet with a high collar, which made him look like a viker, in Quinn's opinion. Pansy Parkinson, in very frilly robes of pale pink, was clutching Malfoy's arm. Crab and Goyle were both wearing green, they resembled moss-colored boulders, and neither of them, 
Quinn wasn't surprised to see, had managed to find a partner. Next came the group of Gryffindors with Harry Potter and his date in the lead. Holy moly, is that Hermione Granger, gawked Eddie as he saw the pretty girl dressed in periwinkle robes. You can say that again, said Tracy in agreement. It's like she's another person. What happened to her? What kind of magic is that? Meh, spoke Quinn. It's a simple work of change of clothes and hairdo, with some glamour charms accentuating everything. Hermione Granger was always pretty. She simply needed a little makeover to show that. Even without all of what we're seeing and some minute changes, she would attract eyes. The Ravenclaw group looked at Quinn with varying gazes and expressions. Quinn stared back at them. What? You know me. Look at me. I like to dress well. I know that kind of stuff. What about her then? asked Terry Boot, his eyes stuck one person in the Gryffindor group. Walking just behind her brother and best friend was Ivy Potter. The Potter princess was dressed in a flowing red dress, long enough to float just above the ground. Her usually straight hair was lightly styled into waves, flowing down her back and brilliant green earrings matching her eyes. Everything from her dress, hair, looks, the way she held herself looked like a fire goddess. Yeah, I see it now. Why so many people asked her out, spoke Michael Corner. She's very pretty, spoke Luna. It was also the first thing ever she had said to Ivy Potter when she delivered Quinn's letter to Hermione Granger. While everyone was looking at Ivy Potter, Eddie was looking somewhere else. Redheads weren't his types. But what he was seeing was totally in his range. He raised his hands and reached around to find Quinn's shoulder and then face. What are you doing, man? asked Quinn swatting the offending hand away. Look what you missed. What? Quinn looked to where Eddie was looking and stilled as his eyes caught what Eddie was seeing. The oak front doors were opened. Outside, he saw an area of lawn right in Castle's front had been transformed into a sort of grotto full of fairy lights, meaning hundreds of actual living fairies were sitting in the rose bushes that had been conjured there and fluttering over the statues of what seemed to be Father Christmas and his reindeer. Everyone turned to look as the Durmstrang students entered with Professor Karkaroff. Crum was at the front of the party, accompanied by his date in shimmering midnight black robes. You're totally missing out, mate. A villa as a date better be worth it. It was Daphne. Be it her blonde hair, blue eyes, or her black dress, everything was what you would call perfect, in tune with each other, creating a sort of harmony that would be absolutely stunning if put into words. A lot of girls gazed at Daphne in unflattering disbelief. When the doors to the Great Hall opened, Crumb's fan club stalked past, throwing Daphne looks of most profound loathing. Pansy Parkinson gaped at her as she walked by with Malfoy, and even he didn't seem to be able to find an insult to throw at her. Tracy turned her gaze to Quinn and stared at his face. Yeah, this is what I imagined. He is making the exact expression I thought he would man. Ache. Well, he's missing the dropped jaw. Oh yeah, no, he did just fine, Eddie spoke up. It was a fair trade. Yup, he left a diamond mine. In return, he got a platinum load. Once again, the crowd in the entrance hall buzzed with activity. It was as if an angel had descended down on Hogwarts. The Bobatine students were all very handsome and beautiful, but she stood on another level even among those people. Fleur Delacour's every step seemed to light up the hall. She was dressed in a simple silver-gray satin dress. Despite that, if asked anyone in the school, they would, with high certainty, crown Fleur as the prettiest girl in the school today. By dressing in such a simple dress, it was as if Fleur was saying that she didn't have to dress up, she could do it, effortlessly. All right, people, time for me to go join my date, said Quinn with magic fixing his clothes. I'll see you inside in a bit. Until then, I hope you enjoy your evening. Look at him, smirked Eddie, rearing to go to his date. He's a dog. Though suddenly, he felt an arm loop around his. He looked to his side and saw Tracy looking up at him with upturned eyes. Should we head inside? Eddie's smirk drained, and he could only wordlessly nod. Right now, he would agree to anything Tracy would ask of him. Quinn walked towards Fleur, who stood in the middle of the hall as if she owned all of it. I guess complimenting you on your appearance would be redundant, wouldn't it? Fleur looked at Quinn, and for a while, she didn't say anything and simply observed Quinn. In turn, he stood there, letting her get a good look at him. Redundant, 
Hmm, I wouldn't say that. Most special, especially I, like to hear compliments, especially from my date. Quinn nodded with a bit of a smile. That's true. Well then, Fleur, you looked unconditionally, utterly, unquestionably gorgeous. Thank you for the compliments. A smile bloomed on her face. You haven't done a bad job yourself. I like you didn't go with the tailcoat like so many others. I like the suit. She pointed at the lower part of the vest. And the pocket watch, an effect I like very much. You just said everything I would have wanted in a compliment today, he said before taking out a long velvet box from his robes, and for that excellent compliment, I have a gift for you. Oh my, I like gifts. Quinn opened the box with a silent snap and showed the platinum necklace with a violet teardrop-shaped jewel floating near the chain instead of hanging from it. He gently picked up the necklace from the box. May I? Yes, you may, said Fleur, turning her back to Quinn showing to him that her dress was a backless one. Quinn unclipped the thin chain and elegantly draped it around her neck. What is this gem? It's glowing faintly. That fleur is an alchemic crystalline material, or a crystal to be simple. It was a similar type of alchemic crystal found in the aquatic vault. Quinn had modified it to be clearer and have less glow, making it suitable for it to be molded into a jewel. Fleur didn't know the rarity of the crystal around her neck, but she did know that it was beautiful. Thank you, Quinn. It's beautiful. I think it's you who makes it look even more beautiful, he said, speaking a line he had suggested to his shy friend. Flattery will get you everywhere, Mr. West. But I'm already there, Miss Delacour. Then Professor McGonagall's voice called, Champions over here, please. Professor McGonagall, who was wearing dress robes of red tartan and had arranged a rather ugly wreath of thistles around the brim of her hat, told them to wait on one side of the doors while everyone else went inside. They were to enter the great hall in procession when the rest of the students had sat down. Fleur and Quinn were stationed at the front of the line with other champions behind them. With some time still left, Quinn decided to break the tension hanging between the eight people, champions, and their dates. How are you guys doing? I must say all of your looking remar. Cable today, he looked at all of them and shrugged. But I'd have to say, I can see a lot of stiffness and nervousness. Everyone shifted on their feet, shifting their eyes off of Quinn for a moment, looking at each other. There's no need to be nervous. The Yule Ball, in essence, is a party. A party held so that we can enjoy ourselves and have the time of our lives. But we've to open the dance, said Hermione, her features painted with a tinge of worry. What if we screw up? I'll not, that's for sure, said Fleur, looking confident. Me neither, added Daphne. She looked as calm as she always did, as if today was just another day at school. Quinn stared between the two girls and nodded before focusing back on Hermione. You're looking at it all wrong, you know? How so? she asked. A good amount people in there can't dance formally at balls. Over that, there's our good chances those can dance aren't going with those who can't. Pretty sure that a lot of the people inside will only come to the dance floor only when the Weird Sisters play something funky. Out of the eight people here, everyone knew how to dance, enough to not embarrass them in front of everyone. But the prospect of dancing in front of everyone with all eyes fixed on them was a prospect not many were excited about. So, in conclusion, relax and calm down, concluded Quinn. Some say potato head and birthday suits help, but if that isn't your deal, I can always help with a bit of magic. It'll take just a little, but it'll get you through the dance. Any takers? There were none. Once everyone else was settled in the hall, Professor McGonagall told the champions and their partners to get in line in pairs and follow her. It's showtime. Quinn looked at Fleur. Ready to impress? Always, she said, taking his arm. The champions entered, and everyone in the great hall applauded as they walked in and started walking up toward a large round table at the top of the hall where the judges were sitting. The walls of the hall had all been covered in sparkling silver frost, with hundreds of garlands of mistletoe and ivy crossing the starry black ceiling. The house tables had vanished. Instead, about a hundred smaller, lantern-lit ones each seating about a dozen people. Dumbledore smiled happily as the champions approached the top table, but Karkaroff wore an expression of deep dissatisfaction 
as he watched Crum and Daphne draw nearer. Ludo Bagman, tonight in robes of bright purple with large yellow stars, was clapping as enthusiastically as any of the students, and Madame Maxime, who had changed her usual uniform of black satin for a flowing gown of lavender silk, was applauding them politely. But Mr. Crouch, Quinn noticed, was not there. The fifth seat at the table was occupied by Percy Weasley. When the champions and their partners reached the table, Percy drew out the empty chair beside him, staring pointedly at Harry. Harry took the hint and sat down next to Percy, who was wearing brand new navy blue dress robes and an expression of such smugness that Quinn thought it ought to be fined. Quinn asked Fleur to walk ahead and stop behind Percy. Mr. Weasley, I have to say, you're looking good. How come Mr. Or Crouch isn't in attendance today? I'm afraid to say Mr. Crouch isn't well, not well at all, hasn't been right since the World Cup. Hardly surprising, overwork. He's not as young as he was, though still quite brilliant, of course, the mind remains as great as it ever was. But the World Cup was a fiasco for the whole ministry, and then Mr. Crouch suffered a huge personal shock with the sudden death of that house elf of his, Blinky, or whatever she was called. Well, as I say, he's getting on, he needs looking after, and I think he's found a definite drop in his home comforts since she left. And then we had the tournament to arrange, and the aftermath of the cup to deal with, that revolting Skeeter woman buzzing around. No, poor man, he's having a well-earned quiet Christmas. Then why are you here? asked Harry. I, he been promoted, from his tone, he might have been announcing his election as supreme ruler of the universe. I'm now Mr. Crouch's personal assistant, and I'm here representing him. I see, I hope he gets well soon, said Quinn. It was night talking to you, Mr. Weasley. Now I have to return to my date. He shook hands with Percy, who really looked like he was enjoying himself. Quinn walked towards his seat. It was only a few steps away, but he froze just as he saw where Fleur had seated herself. Of the pairs, Harry and Hermione and Cedric and Cho were sitting on the edges with Crum and Daphne and Quinn and Fleur in between the two pairs. The thing that made Quinn uncomfortable was that all the girls sat on the right, with the boys sitting on their left. Hey, he said, sitting down beside Fleur, then looked to his side and greeted, Hey, Daphne. The Yule Ball had started. Quinn West, MC, thinking if he should spike the punch, fiction-only reader-author. Yeah, right. That's what he's thinking, sure, buddy. Marcus Belby, calm, boy, preparation is the key to success. Luna Lovegood, dreamy girl, hoping to see lots of fairies today. Eddie Carmichael, suited up, animal magnetism. Uh, ah, yes, um, sure, whatever you say. Tracy Davis, dressed up, she has the legendary move, upturned eyes in her arsenal. Fleur Delacour, beau baton champion, dressed up Vila, Nuff said. Daphne Greengrass, trained heiress. Perfect. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 172. Dancing Begins. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon at patreon.com slash fleeritter. The link is also in the synopsis. Sitting in between Fleur and Daphne was a bit awkward for Quinn, but he also had skin thick as an elephant. He soon got used to it. As it was already eight o'clock, the ball started with a feast. Quinn looked at the plates and cutlery set in front of him. There was no food as yet on the glittering golden plates, but small menus were lying in front of each of them. Quinn picked up his menu, read it carefully, then said very clearly to his plate, Pork chops! And pork chops appeared. Getting the idea, the rest of the table placed their orders with their plates, too. Quinn glanced up at Hermione to see how she felt about this new and more complicated method of dining. Surely it meant plenty of extra work for the house elves? But it seemed that his talk had made a change, as Hermione didn't seem to be bothered by it. She was deep in talks with Harry and hardly seemed to notice what she was eating. He looked to the other side and saw Daphne conversing with Crumb. It surprised him immensely. All the times he had seen Crum, he had never seen the man talk so much, very enthusiastically at that. Well, we have a castle also, not as big as this, nor as comfortable, I am thinking, he was telling Daphne. We have just four floors, and the fires are lit only for magical purposes. But we have grounds larger even than these, 
though in winter we have very little daylight, so we are not enjoying them. But in summer we are flying every day over the lakes and the mountains. Now, now, Victor, said Karkaroff with a laugh that didn't reach his cold eyes. Don't go giving away anything else now, or your charming friend will know exactly where to find us. Dumbledore smiled, his eyes twinkling. Igor, all this secrecy, one would almost think you didn't want visitors. Well, Dumbledore, said Karkaroff, displaying his yellowing teeth to their fullest extent, we are all protective of our private domains, are we not? Do we not jealously guard the halls of learning that have been entrusted to us? Are we not right to be proud that we alone know our school's secrets and right to protect them? Oh, I would never dream of assuming I know all Hogwarts laugh. Secrets, Igor, said Dumbledore amicably. Only this morning, for instance, I took a wrong turning on the way to the bathroom and found myself in a beautifully proportioned room I have never seen before, containing a really rather magnificent collection of chamber pots. When I went back to investigate more closely, I discovered that the room had vanished. But I must keep an eye out for it. Possibly it is only accessible at 5.30 in the morning, or it may only appear at the quarter moon, or when the seeker has an exceptionally full bladder. Quinn smiled into his bite of pork chop. He was really relieved he could smile at the mysterious bathroom. It wasn't the room of requirements, but it had similarities. It would appear when one really wanted to go to a bathroom, but there wasn't one nearby. He had stumbled upon it so many times that it wasn't even funny. Given that Crum had shared something about Durmstrang, Fleur decided to continue the topic. This is nothing, she said dismissively, looking around at the sparkling walls of the Great Hall. At the Palace of Beaubatons, we have ice sculptures all around the dining chamber at Christmas. They don't melt, of course. They are like huge statues of diamond glittering around the place, and the food is simply superb. And we have choirs of wood nymphs to serenade us as we eat. We have none of this ugly armor in the halls, and if a poltergeist ever entered into Beaubatons, he would be expelled like that. She slapped her hand onto the table impatiently. I can create ice that doesn't melt, thought Quinn. Seeing that Fleur crapped on Hogwarts and praised Bobbins, the Hogwarts students on the table started to defend Hogwarts. A heated battle of words began on the table. Well, Hogwarts has me. Isn't that enough? mused Quinn in silence. Hmm, since when did I become so narcissistic? But it's the truth, isn't it? Hmm, isn't that again narcissism? Wait a minute, which comes first? Truth or narcissism? Did I fall upon something profound? What about you, Quinn? What do you think? said Daphne from his left with a slight glare in her eyes, glare directed toward not at him, but his date towards his right. Quinn felt an arm snake around his right arm. He looked and saw Fleur, oh so close to him. Yes, Quinn? What do you think? Um, Quinn gulped for a few different reasons. He could feel something very soft pressed against his arm and a pleasant scent tickle his nose. He tightly smiled before taking a deep breath to steady himself and started to think, indeed, what was about Hogwarts that interested him the most. He had been here more than four years, in those four years, what had called out to him the most. Just as Headmaster Dumbledore said, even he doesn't know all of Hogwarts, meaning there are so many places to explore, so many things to discover. People say that the unknown is scary, but I find the unknown inviting. Hogwarts is filled with so many of those unknowns. To me, the castle, these grounds are a treasure trove waiting for someone to dive in and find all of its jewels and gems. He rested his chin on the back of his hand and smiled. That gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. Daphne, Harry, Hermione, Cedric, and Cho all looked at Quinn. This peer of theirs was famous for many things, but before being the best of his best, before aid, before everything else, Quinn West was recognized for his penchant for being out after curfew at night and that he couldn't be found for hours at a time during the day. That sounds like you, Mr. West. You certainly have been an avid explorer, chuckled Dumbledore from his behind his half-moon glasses. Do you know, Mr. West even found a secret passageway leading to outside the school grounds? Please, Headmaster, I would like if you don't bring my dark past to light. To be caught sneaking out of the school, how embarrassing. His reply made Dumbledore laugh. The old headmaster understood what Quinn actually meant. 
When all the food had been consumed, Dumbledore stood up and asked the students to do the same. Then, with a wave of his wand, all the tables zoomed back along the walls, leaving the floor clear, and then he conjured a raised platform into existence along the right wall. A set of drums, several guitars, a flute, a cello, and some bagpipes were set upon it. The weird sisters now trooped up onto the stage to wildly enthusiastic applause. They were all extremely hairy and dressed in black robes that had been artfully ripped and torn. Let's go. It's time for us to open the dance, Quinn heard Fleur's word whispered into his ear. The weird sisters struck up a slow, mournful tune. Quinn walked onto the brightly lit dance floor, and the next moment he had Fleur's hands in his with the other on her back. Everything in the world ceased to exist as Quinn directed all of his attention to his very beautiful partner, who also seemed to be looking just at him. Then they started to dance to the tune of the music, and the thoughts about a crowd watching them escaped their minds. You dance well, praised Fleur. You're an easy partner to lead, replied Quinn in counterpraise. I like that you're giving me credit, but Quinn, you don't have to do it every time. Sometimes it's better to simply accept the praise. Then thank you for the praise, Fleur. I'm a good dancer. Much better. The pair continued to talk, and other people had also entered the dance floor. They, along with other champion pairs, were no longer the center of attention, but Quinn and Fleur didn't care about them and simply continued dancing, enjoying each other's proximity. While Quinn and Fleur weren't paying much attention to others, they were definitely pay in attention to them. Fleur's hold on her allure had subconsciously weakened a level. Gentle waves of vila allure drifted from her, spreading towards the surroundings. In certain circumstances, a vila's allure just didn't make herself attractive. Right now, as everybody watched, Fleur Delacour and Quinn West looked like a pair chosen by heaven. The pair looked so attractive that the people outside the dance floor only had eyes for them. They looked so good together. Are they together? Wouldn't that be fitting? They seem like the perfect couple. Only if I could get someone like Quinn. If I would have asked Fleur out, it would have been there. Dream on, pal. I could say the same to you. Quinn heard the final, quavering note from the bagpipe with a sense of satisfaction. The weird sisters stopped playing, applause filled the hall once more, and Quinn smiled at Fleur. The song is over, Fleur. Yes, and? Your grip's still on, you know? Fleur didn't let Quinn go from their dance stance, standing close to him, gazing up at him with a smile. Do you not like it? There is nothing to not like here, Fleur, but as I told you before, I've some prior commitments to fulfill. Dancing with other girls, even though you have me, that isn't flattering, my dear date. Oh, please, we both know you too have to go and mingle around. That's true, she sighed. Let's hope some of them could handle me. The two separated and looked around the dance floor in the hall to find their respective objectives. I think we should start with the other champions, suggested Quinn. Fleur gazed around as she lightly hummed, I see Harry Potter and his date. Should we go to them? Yes, Harry Potter would do. He can withstand a good amount. All right, let's start with them. I did ask Hermione for a dance. Harry Potter and Hermione Granger danced together revolving slowly with gently steering around the floor. The two looked at peace with a tinge of embarrassment flushing their cheeks. The two had been facing many waves and sniggers while dancing alone with other champions. You weren't lying when you said you know how to dance, said Hermione. Glad you finally believe me, grinned Harry. Dad had always been insistent that Ivy and I should know how to dance. Mum was all for it. Though I've only danced with Ivy for the most, then the pair heard a cheerful voice call out, Harry, my boy. Both looked to see Quinn walking towards them with a jolly look on his face. You two look utterly dashing. Harry and Hermione exchanged glances. Thank you, you two as well, said Harry. Thank you, Harry. Now I would like to ask your very lovely date to a dance, said Quinn, then turning to Hermione. May I have a dance, my fair lady? Huh, what? said Harry, confused. Quinn glanced back at Harry and reached out his hand. Here, take this. Harry instinctively raised his hand to receive and found a familiar wrapped chocolate cube in his palm. Chocolate? You know what? Give that back, smiled Quinn and took back the cube, then pointed with chin towards Harry's back. You're about to get something much sweeter. 
Harry turned and saw Fleur Delacour standing behind with a charming smile on her face. Good evening, Harry. You clean up well. The boy turned back just to see Quinn leading his equally surprised date away with his hand on her back. Don't worry, you'll get her back after a dance, he heard Fleur say. Until then, let's have some fun. Huh? Ms. Granger, I must admit, even though I think Fleur is unquestionably eye-catching, but you're the one who made the most impact today, said Quinn, dancing with a still-reeling Hermione. I mean, look at you. You look spectacular tonight. Hermione looked the taller Quinn. He wasn't as tall as Ron, but taller than Harry. Both Ron and Harry had lean physiques, but with Quinn's much wider arms holding her, she couldn't help but compare. Quinn West definitely worked out. What am I thinking? Hermione lowered her face to hide the blush. On her cheeks, her face was betraying her embarrassing thoughts. Thank you. Any progress on the golden egg? Hermione sighed, hearing the question. He's taking it slow. I don't think he has even been to the library to research on the golden egg. What about Fleur Delacour? How much progress has she made? Ms. Granger, why do you assume that I know how's Fleur doing on her egg? Are you not her date? While that might be true, I only get to talk to Fleur during meals. Other time, I'm busy with the tournament and my usual commitments. About that, I have to ask, what are those commitments? I believe it's just not me who's curious about it. Everyone in the school wants to know. Oh, you know, this and that. But mostly, it's learning magic. How are you so good at magic? You're only one year above me, asked the girl who had fallen in love with magic. Quinn observed the girl in his arms and thought about his answer. It's not a fair comparison. Well, Mr. Granger, I'm from a magical household who have been surrounded by magic ever since I can remember. Tell me, do you have a computer at home, Miss Granger? Hermione tilted her head in confusion. Yes, we do. My mum uses it for work. Why do you ask? Do you know how to use it? Yes, mum taught me how to use it since I was five. I like it. It's fun. Then between you, who had been using it since childhood, and me, who uses it a couple times during summer break, who do you think can work a computer better? I suppose me. I'd be better than you. And I've no doubt about it, agreed Quinn. He knew how to use a computer from his memories, but he was grossly out of touch with the machine. Just like that, it's natural for me to be better at magic than you're. I've been in contact with it for a time much longer than you have been. But so have Ivy, Harry, and Ron. Not many children learn magic before schooling. It's a hassle for parents to manage magic-enabled children. Only a few learn things like potions, and has Ivy started you on a clumency? Eh? Ah, yes, she did. It's a fascinating form of magic. It is. He could feel her in-progress acclumency shields. My family allowed to me study magic without restraints. I could study magic as much I wanted, and unlike many children, I like to read. You can understand that, don't you? Yes, I can, nodded Hermione. She knew precisely what Quinn meant. You mean, you had a wand? Oh no, my family wasn't that permitting, I just studied. Hermione nodded and shook her mind of the thought about how children could be very mean and changed the subject. What did you use a computer for? For games. Of course, you're a boy. That I am, and don't pretend you didn't play as well, beamed Quinn. Speaking of games, did you have the chance to open my Christmas present? Ah, yes, I saw it, the wooden box, she talked excitedly. What is it? I wasn't able to open it. I know it can be opened. Is it a trick box? It's a trick box, isn't it? Is there something in the box, or is the box itself a gift? Don't tell me. I want to see it on my own. Quinn chuckled as he twirled Hermione. All right, then. I'll leave it to you. A sense of reward is a strong motivator. It's not a jump scare, right? A peal of free laughter escaped Quinn without restraint. Ivy Potter had been watching her friends the entire time she had been at the Yule Ball, sitting near the side, watching them dance and having fun while she sat without a date. I know I rejected a lot, but that doesn't mean I don't want to dance she thought, while sighing. She took a sip of the punch she had fetched herself and watched the people without a thought in her mind. As she did that, she saw a Quinn walk towards her in a gray suit and a smile on her face. Ivy Potter, I'm here for my promised dance. The Potter twin stared up at Quinn and she to admit he looked quite fetching. I don't know if I should be flattered or worried about your appraising gaze, Ivy, 
smiled Quinn. Well, I'm trying to look good, so I will take that glint of approval in your eyes as a compliment. Ivy sighed and placed a hand into Quinn's as she got up. You're lucky you're looking good right now. Thank you, smiled Quinn as he led the redhead to the dance floor. You look gorgeous as well. Of course I do. Hmm, she was right. People should accept compliments. What are you talking about? Hmm, oh nothing, just something I learned. Quinn West, MC, Dance Baby, Dance. Fleur Delacour, Vila, Alu, is a mysterious magic. Hermione Granger transformed beauty, got a puzzle box from Quinn. Ivy Potter, wants to dance, sees what she sees, can't be helped. Fiction only reader. Fiction only reader author, to be continued. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 173, Yule Ball, Red Fun, Kiss. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon at com slash reader. The link is also in the synopsis. The song was a slow one, where the pair would slowly sway. The couples would usually stare into each other's eyes, hold each close, feeling as intimate as one could while dancing in silence. Many pairs on the dance were doing just that, but not Quinn West and Ivy Potter. They were looking into each other's eyes, but unlike others, they weren't silent. I heard from Hermione that you weren't able to get yourself a date, said Quinn. Not a surprise, given that I was your first choice. Your requirements were too high. Oh, don't flatter yourself, she sniggered amusingly. And since when did you start calling Hermione by her given name? Just before when I was dancing with her. She's a fascinating one, that girl. Did you know that she has a terrific natural memory, better than mine? Thank magic for acclumency and a history of bullying before coming to Hogwarts, but that went unsaid. She's sharp as a tack, all right? There was a layer of pride in her voice. So, Daphne with Crumb, huh? Continued Ivy. Quinn looked across the dance floor to see Daphne and Crumb sitting on a sideline table. The pair seemed to be conversing with Crumb speaking, while Daphne listened with occasional nods and inserts of her own. Yes, it was a surprise, replied Quinn. I wonder how those two got started talking. From what I know, those two aren't the talking types. I heard that they met in the library, and their friendship began from there. Ah, the library. Yes, now I recall. Crumb uses Madame Pince's authoritarian rule over the library to escape from his developing fan club of fantasizing fangirls and obsessed fanboys. I have to say, Crumb might not be the smartest tool in the shed, but he makes it up with street smarts. He picked up the situation in the library pretty quickly. Then, you made Daphne the coordinator of the teams. That probably got them talking. You know about that? I talk to every member of the Gryffindor Quidditch team on a regular basis. I know Daphne's in contact with every single one of them. That makes sense, he nodded before studying the girl in his arms. Ivy noticed Quinn's gaze. She waited for him to say something or look away, but he didn't. What is it? Why are you looking at me like that? I've known Daphne for three years, going four, and you for two years, and some, of course, our relationship has been an on and off one, but I can say I know you pretty well. But in all that time, I still don't know both of your stories. What's the deal between you and Daphne? Ivy's eyes flashed with multiple emotions, with her face falling into a smileless one. Quinn felt the slight tension in her body and immediately knew that she had become uncomfortable. You don't have to answer that, he said. Sorry if I brought up uncomfortable memories. No, it's fine. It's not uncomfortable per se, she sighed. We used to be friends, you know, best friends. Best friends. It doesn't look like that, at least currently. It doesn't. Daphne and I have known each other since before I can remember. Our mothers are good friends. Quinn nodded as he recollected the interactions between Lily Potter and Sophie Greengrass last year at King's Crossing. They looked and acted like close friends. So ever since we were kids, our mothers visited each other. As such, Daphne, Harry, and I have spent countless days playing with each other at each other's houses. She was my first friend outside of Harry. Ivy chuckled reminiscently before continuing. What changed? Quinn glanced at his right arm as he felt Ivy's grip tighten. He looked back at Ivy, but she didn't seem to notice her actions and continued her tightened grip. Hmm, 
It's nice. It's like a massage, he thought. Hey, little lady, if you want to play the squeeze game, please pick it up with someone on your level. Huh, what? Wise subconscious grip loosened. Quinn gazed back at his hand before sighing. You were about to say something about how you and Daphne fell out. She is a jealous stone-faced prick who can't handle if attention is taken off from her, and the rant started. Our mothers enjoyed playing teachers. Well, my mum is a professor now, but that's not the point. We used to learn everything together. My mum used to teach things that didn't require magic, while Auntie Sophie used to teach us about the traditions and cultural tidbits of the wizarding world. That made sense. Sophie Greengrass would be a much better person to teach the subjects like etiquette. Did you learn how to dance for Mrs. Greengrass? Hmm. Yeah, she was the one to teach Harry, Daphne, Tracy, and me to dance. We took lessons together. Lucky ducks, muttered Quinn. What did you say? Oh, nothing. Please carry on. She would always try to show me up. Whatever I tried, she would pick it up and try to be better than me. I once tried to take up baking because I wanted to eat cookies and ask Daphne if she wanted to do it together, but she declined. Then when I started to bake and when I finally got a good batch out, the very next week, Auntie Sophie told that Daphne was suddenly very interested in backing, and after that, she came home with cookies. Ivy peered right into Quinn's eyes and stated, and you might not believe this, but she smiled that day, that smug and arrogant smile. Then it started. Every time I did anything new, she would do it too, and even after she became statue face, her eyes would always have that same look. Ivy glanced up from Ivy towards Daphne, and if he was being honest, he couldn't see it. The Daphne he knew was a straight arrow. This sounded more like Astoria to him. Sounds tough, he said. It might not have been a big deal. A children's squabble rarely was. You don't believe me, do you? asked Ivy. It's not that but for me to truly understand a story, I need to know the full story. You want to know her side? Yes, but not just Daphne. I want to see what Harry and Astoria think, though I doubt Astoria would remember any of it. Plus, I would like to see what your mother, and then he sighed in bliss, and Mrs. Greengrass, I think. Ivy looked at Quinn as if he was being weird. If only she could listen to his thoughts, she would know how accurate her thoughts were. Believe it or not, but this is the dance I was looking to most this evening, said Quinn with a broad smile on his face. Oh, please, you've already danced with half a dozen girls already, the girl smiled. To how many of them have you said the same line? I always thought you were somewhat of a playboy. No, my dear Tracy, smiled Quinn, earnestness flashing. Dancing with girls was pleasant and enjoyable, but I know dancing with you will be mighty fun. I just know it. Tracy glanced towards the weird sisters, and they had taken a pause from traditional ball music and had switched to the much more comfortable and contemporary ball music. See, even the music agrees with me. They just put their best track of the night, grinned Quinn. Tracy giggled as she scooted near Quinn as more and more people joined the dance floor. With time becoming comfortable about joining the dance floor, to dance with their dates. So, how is your evening going with Eddie? asked Quinn. Also, where is he? His feet got tired from dancing, so we took a break. Last I saw him, Luna was pulling him and Marcus into a strange three-people dance. She smiled. Eddie is doing just fine. He's much more mellow than I thought he would be when we first met. Quinn laughed, recalling Daphne and Tracy's first official meeting with Eddie and Marcus. He was going through the I don't care phase and acted like he wasn't interested in talking to you girls, and Marcus was so shy that he didn't speak more than a handful of words. Yeah, that's a fun day to remember. Yes, do you remember Daphne and Marcus sitting side small by side, not saying a word to each other, both for different reasons, of course. Daphne said that she almost forgot that Marcus was sitting beside her. Really? Marcus remembers it quite differently. He quite liked sitting in silence beside Daphne, said he enjoyed the company. What were we doing at that time? If I remember correctly, you and Eddie were challenging me at a game of concentration each, two games at simultaneously, and I was solidly beating both of you. Huh, is that so? I can't seem to remember, said Tracy, smiling coyly. Of course you don't, chuckled Quinn. 
The two fell into silence as the song went through a calm and slow yet deep buildup. Tracy watched Quinn as he seemed to enjoy the music, slowly leading her with him. He was cute, charming, funny, and always knew what to say. A very attractive boy. Don't go there, Tracy, she thought. Daphne likes him, so you can't. She always had a little crush on Quinn. Maybe ever since she met him. He was always fun, always upbeat, perpetually doing something new and exciting. It would always make her and the people close to him wonder about what he would do next. Oh, Daphne, why did you have to choose such a cute one, thought Tracy. Well, I'll let this one go, so you better not let him go. Well, it's time for us to part, my dear Tracy, she heard Quinn speak. Hmm, why? Your date has returned. Tracy separated from Quinn and turned back to see Eddie standing a little distance with two goblets in his hand. She turned back to see Quinn walking while waving his hand. Hey, Eddie said, walking near her before presenting a goblet to her. This is for you. Tracy took the goblet and felt the cold metal snug comfortably around her palm. Thank you, but why? I saw you dancing with Quinn, and you haven't sat down once since the feast. I assumed that you would be parched. Please drink. You should stay hydrated. You don't want to faint from dehydration. Believe me, not fun. Tracy gazed down at the pinkish liquid in her cup before looking back up at Eddie, who watched her, waiting for her to drink. All right, Tracy, this one is cute as well. I'm back. Fleur was talking with one of the Durmstrang girls when she heard the voice of her date and turned to face him. So, you finally remember me. Oh, don't be like that. I returned after every dance. It's not my fault that you weren't available, said Quinn smiling with his hands behind his back. But it seems you're available now. May I have a dance, my lovely lady? Don't you get tired? You have been dancing for a long while now, she said, getting a shrug from Quinn. I don't want to dance anymore, but I do want to do something. Sure, we can do that if you don't want to dance. What do you want to do? Fleur nudged towards the great hall entrance, pointing across the entrance hall at the oak main doors. Let's go outside. Let's go for a walk. Pretending they wanted more drinks, Quinn and Fleur left the great hall, edged around the dance floor, and slipped out into the entrance hall. The front doors stood open, and the fluttering fairy lights in the rose garden winked and twinkled as they went down the front steps, where they found themselves surrounded by bushes, winding, ornamental paths, and giant stone statues. They could hear splashing water, which sounded like a fountain. Here and there, people were sitting on carved benches. He and Fleur set off along one of the winding paths through the rose bushes, and except the soft chirps, not a sound disturbed the pair. They had reached a giant stone reindeer, over which they could see the sparkling jets of a tall fountain, and near it, a stone bench. They decided to sit down and watch the water in the moonlight. Both of them didn't speak a word to each other for a while, before Fleur broke the silence. This is not a good place to sit, is it? Not. It is not, he replied. They could hear sounds of giggling, ruffling from the rose bushes around them. A lot of couples were getting busy on the lovely night of Christmas. Quinn pulled out his fake wand and cast a silencing ward along with another one. What did you cast? asked Fleur. Quinn placed his fake wand back into his suit. I cast two wards. One is a sound isolation ward. It keeps dull sounds. It works both ways, inside and out. The second one is a static invisibility ward. There was a smile in his voice as he finished. Fleur gave him a look, asking to explain why he sounded so happy. The static invisibility ward is one of the first wards I ever learned, he explained. The day I first used it, I sneaked into my grandfather's cellar and sat down, waiting for him. I wasn't familiar with the usage of this ward back then, so I didn't account for the change in lighting. My grandfather thought I was an intruder and shot me with a charged, stunning spell, which, as I now recall, hit me right in the chest. You lie, she said, interest filling her voice. No, it happened seriously. I was knocked out for a few minutes and woke up to see my grandfather with a drink in his hand. Not going to lie, he was very cool at that moment. Quinn noticed a gaze on him and saw Fleur gazing at him intently with her blue eyes. The dulled night sound set the perfect atmosphere, and both knew what was coming. It wasn't clear who closed the distance, but a few moments later, they were kissing. They shared a short and chaste kiss before Quinn ended it. 
What is it? asked Fleur, though she did have an inkling. Quinn didn't divert her eyes from Fleur and held it. I like you a lot, Fleur. You're stunning and attractive, believe me, even without your allure, you're truly a very captivating girl. But I don't think I like you that way. Fleur slowly pulled back and spoke. Quinn, it doesn't have to mean anything. It could be just two people fooling around, just having some fun. I find you attractive as well, but don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to start something here. It won't be sensible to start something here, I'll be leaving Hogwarts by the end of this year, but you would still have two years of schooling at Hogwarts left. That doesn't work for me. Yeah, that's logical and a smart decision on your part, said Quinn turning his eyes to the moon hanging above. But you see, I can't fool around, maybe in the future, but not right now. He glanced back at her and continued, That was my first kiss, you know. Fleur blinked in surprise. What? You're joking, right? She couldn't believe that someone like Quinn hadn't had his first kiss till now. She had hers way before Quinn's age. Nope, all true, he said, leaning into the bench. That's the reason why I don't want to fool around, even though you're the one who's proposing it. I have no problems with people fooling around. It's their choice, and as long it's consensual, I'm a hundred percent fine with it. But I don't want my first ever relationship, if we can this that, to be a casual fling, not even if it's for a couple of minutes here alone at a bench. Maybe I'm overreacting to this, but these are my current thoughts and feelings. Quinn smiled as he finished, and I can't do anything about them. Fleur also leaned back into the stone bench and sighed. That's not how I thought today was going to end. Thank you, I strive to surprise people, smiled Quinn and loosened his tie a little. Really, that was your first kiss? Fleur couldn't help but ask. A hundred percent true. But how? Well, I've been a little too busy to explore that part of my life yet. Are you sure you just didn't get chances? Oh, please, snorted Quinn. Look at me. I'm a prime piece that everyone wants to get their hands on, and now I can say that my first kiss was with a Vila. So, how was it? What? You know, the kiss. How did I do? Hmm. It was okay, she said and got up. Okay? It was okay? He watched as Fleur stepped outside of the ward line. Miss Delacour, I have a long record of being exemplary at my first attempts at anything I do. He got up as Fleur started to walk away. Fleur? Fleur! Miss Delacour, please clarify what you mean by okay. The Vila's melodious laugh sounded as Quinn's call sounded in the night. Quinn West. Yeah, this isn't gonna work. I'm not okay with that, okay? Ivy Potter, Potter Princess, Troubled Friendship, Tracy Davis, Bubbly Beauty, on the lookout for cute boys. Fleur Delacour Vila, what can I say it was okay? Fiction only reader, author, yeah, so that's how it went. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction, or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 174, Yuletide End, Possibility. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Pi Patreon, itly.patreon.com slash, the link is also in the synopsis. Quinn walked to the Great Hall alone without Fleur. The Vila was tired from the hectic party and decided to retire for the night. Quinn wanted to escort her back to the Bobaton's carriages, but they came across Headmistress Maxime, a very angry Olymp Maxime. She swept through corridors like an angry hippogriff, and when she saw them, Maxime sent Quinn away, stating that she'd take Fleur from there onwards. Neither Quinn nor Fleur wanted to argue with the angry half-giantess, so they obliged and separated, with Quinn returning to Great Hall. Why am I returning? he sighed. I should have retired for the night. Today's sleep is going to be a good and deep one. He was a right type of tired. The type where he would slip into sleep the second he hit the bed top. He entered the snow-white Christmas-decorated hall. The vibe of the ball had changed since he exited. In the middle of the hall, on the dance floor, a few couples slow danced to the relaxed and romantic music of the Weird Sisters, while others sat in groups, chatting with each other, laughing and mingling with each other, making cherished memories of a wonderful night. He saw Eddie and Tracy and Marcus and Luna still dancing, so he sat down at the table, waiting for them to end, so that he could return with them to the Ravenclaw common room. Quinn stared down at the floor. 
saw sparkling confetti spread across the floor and decided to pass some time. His learning from the Nordic Viking book he got from Denmark popped into his mind, and he called upon a bit of his magic. He blew softly towards the floor, and with magic wind magic backing up his breath, the confetti on an entire section of floor in front of him floated away, gliding across the floor. Quinn, the call of his name, broke him out of his little pastime. Quinn turned to come to face with a pair of striking crystal blue eyes. Daphne, I didn't see you there. How are you? Enjoying yourself at the ball? Daphne stared at Quinn while giving a glance towards the now confetti-free floor. I am, she said before looking around. Where is Delacour? Fleur was tired, so she decided to retire for the night, said Quinn. What about you? What are you doing alone here? Where is Crumb? Daphne ran an errant hand through her silky straight blonde looks. His friends came and took him away. I think they had fire whiskey with them which meant that they probably went to a secluded area to sneak some drinks. You didn't join them? I don't drink, and it was only boys. There's always a first time for everything, though I would suggest that you go with something lighter than fire whiskey. I saw a label once, and oh boy, the spirit content scared me a little. No, thank you, denied Daphne firmly. I don't want to go drinking right now. You sound like you've got experience with drinking. Quinn ruffled the back of his head and sighed with a chuckle mixed in. No, I haven't drunk any liquor. Technically, I haven't. He had ingested quite a lot of questionable stuff that he brewed while experimenting with potions. Some of them had alcoholic content. I don't like the feeling of being drunk. Everything is a little too loose, a bit too light. That's a little uncomfortable to me. He gazed at Daphne and asked, Is Crumb returning? I don't know, he didn't have to reply with his friends, pulling, dragging him along. I see, well then, he got up and offered his hand to Daphne, may I have one last dance? Daphne quite readily took the offered hand and let Quinn lead her to the dance floor, where the song was still slow and the ambiance was soothingly romantic. I'm glad that Crumb went away, you know, said Quinn as they started to dance. Daphne's heart skipped a beat. What do you mean? Well, you and he were together all evening, so I didn't have the chance to ask you to dance. It would well, have been a pity if I didn't get a chance to dance with you. Not to mention how pretty you look today. It reminds me of the time we first danced together. Daphne reminisced about Quinn and her first dance at the Christmas ball a few years back. At that time, the boy dancing with her was just an annoying yet interesting boy. She looked up and gazed at the smiling face of Quinn. That was a rememberable ball and dance. Of course it was, she saw him grin. I was there with you, and I'm highly entertaining to hang around, ask anyone. Yes, you are, she agreed with a smile of her own. Quinn's eyes widened a fraction at the smile on Daphne's face. He had made her plenty of times. Small smiles were what he was used to seeing on Daphne's face, not broad, unrestrained smiles on the neutral face Daphne. For a moment, it took his breath away. He couldn't take his eyes off her, and even slowed down a bit just to admire the sight in front of him. Daphne didn't notice Quinn's change and continued to gaze at him. To anyone who was seeing them, the pair were looking into each other's eyes with no care of what was happening around them. And someone was indeed watching them. Victor Crumb had finally been able to evade his schoolmates and friends' attempts to get him to drink with them and leave them behind to return to the hall back to his date. Upon searching for Daphne, he found him dancing with another guy, which he was okay with. A girl like Daphne was bound to have many friends, his opinion. And the guy she was dancing with was also familiar to him, Quinn West, the organizer of the Quidditch tournament and the person who had made his time at Hogwarts much more enjoyable. As such, his impression of Quinn was a great one, despite some unusual things like having an office at school. If that was it, he would have walked onto the dance floor and informed Daphne that he was back and asked her one last dance before escorting her back. It was getting late. Crumb liked Daphne a lot. She wasn't like others and didn't act differently towards him because of his popularity and treated him like he was just another guy. It was a desirable quality that a lot of people in Kroom's position sought after in their friends and close ones. That's why he asked her out to be his date at the ball. 
but as he now watched them, he noticed the smile on Daphne's face. He had been acquainted with Daphne for a few months now, but not once in that time had she showed him such a beautiful smile. It made him not go and watch them from the side. He then saw Quinn lean down towards Daphne. Is he going to kiss her? He thought. But it didn't happen, and instead, Crumb watched Quinn whisper something into Daphne's ears. Daphne turned and saw him, Crumb, before glancing back at Quinn, who was walking backward while giving her an exaggerated bow as he wished Daphne a merry yuletide. Crumb saw Daphne fix her dress before walking towards. Ah, escaped him. The smile on her face was gone. When the Weird Sisters finished playing at midnight, everyone gave them a last, loud round of applause and started to wend their way into the entrance hall. Many people were expressing the wish that the ball could have gone on longer, but Quinn was perfectly happy to be going to bed. He had overdone it, and now the soles of his feet were hurting. Out in the entrance hall, Quinn, Marcus, and Luna saw Eddie saying goodnight to Tracy before she went back to the dungeons. She gave him a sweet smile before walking away with Daphne in tow. Eddie joined Quinn and others with a silly smile on his face. Sorry for the wait. Let's go. You should have walked her back to the Slytherin common room, said Quinn. Marcus nodded. Yeah, you missed a chance. Luna looked at Quinn and Marcus before giving repeated nods to Eddie. Eh? Eddie looked back, but Tracy was already out of the entrance hall. Should I go now? But Daphne's with her. It's too late, forget it, said Marcus. Look, Quinn just yawned in public. That doesn't happen a lot. Come on, let's go. Ever, why buddy is tired. Damn, you saw that, huh? Said Quinn, stretching his hands up before wrapping his arm around Luna's shoulder. How was your day today, Luna? A tired Luna leaned against Quinn. It was fun. Dancing is fun, especially with more people. Yes, it is, smiled Quinn. Christmas was over, and with it, the Yule Ball. Everybody got up late on Boxing Day. The Gryffindor common room was much quieter than it had been lately, many yawns punctuating the lazy conversations. Hermione's hair were back to somewhere between bushy and wavy again. She confessed to Harry that she had used liberal amounts of Sleekeasy's hair potion on it for the ball. But it's way too much bother to do every day, she said matter-of-factly, scratching a purring crookshanks behind the ears. It was time now to think of the homework they had neglected during the first week of the holidays. Everybody seemed to be feeling relatively flat now that Christmas was over. Everybody except Harry, that is, who was starting, once again, to feel slightly nervous. The trouble was that February the 24th looked a lot closer from this side of Christmas, and he still hadn't done anything about working out the clue inside the golden egg. Therefore, he started taking the egg out of his trunk every time he went up to the dormitory, opened it, and listened intently, hoping that this time it would make some sense. He strained to think what the sound reminded him of, apart from thirty musical saws, but he had never heard anything else like it. He closed the egg, shook it vigorously, and opened it again to see if the sound had changed, but it hadn't. He tried asking the egg questions, shouting over all the wailing, but nothing happened. He even threw the egg across the room, though he hadn't really expected that to help. And so the first day of the new term arrived, and Harry set off to lessons, weighed down with books, parchment, and quills as usual, but also with the lurking worry of the egg heavy in his stomach, as though he were carrying that around with him too. Hey, Harry? It was Cedric Diggory. Harry could see Cho waiting for him in the entrance hall below. Yeah, said Harry, internally comparing Cho to Hermione and concluding that Hermione was better. Cedric looked as though he didn't want to say whatever it was in front of Ron, who shrugged, looking bad-tempered, and continued to climb the stairs. Listen. Cedric lowered his voice as Ron disappeared. I owe you one for telling me about the dragons. You know that golden egg? Does yours wail when you open it? As much as Harry's competitiveness wanted to beat Cedric, he couldn't keep the news about dragons to himself and relate it to the Hufflepuff Seeker as he didn't wish Cedric to die. Harry was sure if Hagrid hadn't told him about the dragons, he would have died on the day of the first task. Yeah, said Harry. All his egg did was wail. Well, take a bath, okay? What? Take a bath and, er, take the egg with you and, er, just mull things over in hot water. It'll help you think, trust me. Harry stared at him. 
Tell you what, Cedric said. Use the prefect's bathroom. Fourth door to the left of that statue of Boris the Bewildered on the fifth floor. Passwords ripe red apples. Gotta go. See you around. He grinned at Harry again and hurried back down the stairs to Cho. Harry walked back to Gryffindor Tower alone. That had been bizarre advice. Why would a bath help him to work out what the wailing egg meant? Was Cedric pulling his leg? Was he trying to make Harry look like a fool? After thinking for a while, he decided to first take this strange advice to Hermione and Ivy. His think tank would know what to do, as Harry had no idea how long a bath he'd to work out the secret of the golden egg. He decided to do it at night, when Harry would be able to take as much time as he wanted. Seeing that Cedric had suggested using the prefect's bathroom, he took him on the offer. Um, I can do this on my own. You don't have to come with me, he said, looking at his two companions. You've been too lax for so long, said his twin sister Ivy. We can't risk you wasting more time. Uh-huh. We will find the egg's secret tonight said Hermione in agreement. Ron had been deemed too loud for him to accompany to this late-night excursion, and he was sleepy. They had been caught out of bed and out of bounds by Filch, the caretaker in the middle of the night once before, and had no desire to repeat the experience. But, it's the boy prefect's bathroom, he sent a weak rebuke. You two are girls. Not a problem, it's after curfew. Ivy shot down him and raised an old parchment, the fabled marauder's map and we already checked, there's no one in the bath. When they reached the statue of Boris the Bewildered, a lost-looking wizard with his gloves on the wrong hands, Harry located the right door, leaned close to it, and muttered the password, Red Ripe Apples, just as Cedric had told him. The door creaked open. The trio slipped inside and bolted the door behind them. His immediate reaction was that it would be worth becoming a prefect just to be able to use this bathroom. It was softly lit by a splendid candle-filled chandelier, and everything was made of white marble, including what looked like an empty rectangular swimming pool sunk into the middle of the floor. About a hundred golden taps stood all around the pool's edges, each with a differently colored jewel set into its handle. There was also a diving board. Long white linen curtains hung at the windows, a large pile of fluffy white towels sat in a corner, and a single golden-framed painting was on the wall. It featured a blonde mermaid who was fast asleep on a rock, her lengthy hair over her face. It fluttered every time she snored. Who's there? The sudden voice followed by a loud splash of water. It was as if someone had dumped a lot of water from a height. The trio turned to stone and stiffly turned towards the source of the voice. But the trio couldn't see the person as it was January, the peak of winter. Due to that, the pool was filled with hot water. As a result, the bathroom was filled with dense white mist, limiting their vision. Then abruptly, the mist parted from over the pool, revealing the person. Ivy's instantly recognized the person, despite his hair went and down with most of his torso covered in colorful foam and multicolored bubbles of varying sizes. Some were even as big as footballs. Quinn, she exclaimed. In front of them, sitting near an edge of the pool, sat Quinn West, submerged, staring at them as if they had just done something punishable by law. What are you three doing here? he asked, hiding a sigh behind his words. What are you doing here? asked Harry, calming his beating heart down. We're on the fifth floor, the floor with the Ravenclaw common room entrance and my office. This is the prefect's bathroom, said Quinn before pointing at himself. I'm a prefect, he pointed at them. You three aren't. But it's after curfew, supplied Hermione. Yeah, so? The three realized who they were talking to. This guy didn't understand the concept of curfew. Again, why are you here? Asked Quinn, pushing them for an answer. Quinn was surprised when he heard the echoing footsteps as, at that time, he had around half the pool water suspended into the air. We're here to solve the egg, said Harry. Ah, so you finally found how the egg works, huh? Aren't you guys a little too late, though? The three Gryffindors saw Quinn get up, and instantly... Hermione and Ivy flushed a deep red. Quinn was topless, with only a towel around his waist. Harry didn't show any change as he had seen similar sights after every intense Quidditch game or practice. We don't know how it works, said Ivy, pushing the blush down. We just know that it has something to do with water. That's good enough, I guess, 
said Quinn, walking behind a changing screen to get some clothes. His relaxation time was over. What do you think you need to do for? Are the egg to start working? Harry, Ivy, and Hermione looked at each other and nodded. They stripped out of their clothing down to their bathing suits. They stepped into the pool. It was so deep that their feet barely touched the bottom. Harry stretched out his arms, lifted the egg in his wet hands, and opened it. The wailing, screeching sound filled the bathroom, echoing and reverberating off the marble walls, but it sounded just as incomprehensible as ever, if not more so with all the echoes. He snapped it shut again, worried that the sound would attract Filch, wondering whether that hadn't been Cedric's plan. Try put it into the water, suggested Hermione while swimming in the pool. Oh, the three heard Quinn's voice from behind the screen, and when he didn't continue, they knew that Hermione had struck gold. Go on then, open it under the water, nudged Ivy. Harry put the egg inside water and opened it with a wince in his eyes. This time, it didn't wail. They could hear gurgling sounds coming out of the water with popping bubbles on the surface. It took Harry a moment to realize, but the answer struck like a lightning strike. I need to put my head as well. Harry took a great breath and slid under the surface, and now, sitting on the marble bottom of the bubble-filled bath, I think he heard a chorus of eerie voices singing to him from the open egg in his hands. Come seek us where our voices sound. We cannot sing above the ground. And while you're searching, ponder this. We've taken what you'll sorely miss. An hour long you'll have to look, and to recover what we took. But past an hour, the prospect's black. Too late, it's gone. It won't come back. Harry let himself float back upward and broke the bubbly surface, shaking his hair out of his eyes. So? Asked Ivy. Yeah. Come seek us where our voices sound, and if I need persuading, hang on, I need to listen again. He sank back beneath the water, and this time, Hermione and Ivy joined them. It took three more underwater renditions of the egg song before Harry had it memorized. Ivy and Hermione were done in two dips. I've got to go and look for people who can't use their voices above the ground, he said slowly. Er, who could that be? Slow, aren't you? They looked up and saw Quinn. He had dressed up and was now smiling down at them from outside the pool. But well, you're on the right path. A pity that you didn't come to me, a lost opportunity for me, but oh well, I look forward to seeing you at the second task. Harry and Ivy furrowed his brows as, in the end, before he left, Quinn gave a fleeting glance to Hermione, a glance that didn't seem a normal glance. What was that? asked Harry. Ivy shook her head. I don't know. Outside the bath, Quinn stopped for a second as a thought struck his mind. He stood on the spot for a while as his mind churned with a single view. Wait, does it mean that I could become a hostage? No, right? That thought plagued him all night. Quinn West, MC. Is he clueless or does he understand? Daphne Greengrass, hostage candidate. From what people say, her smile is gorgeous. Victor Crumb, champion. Ah, he understands that he was working towards a dead end. Golden Subtrio, a diverse group out on the night expedition. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction, or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 175, Runic Marble, Background Politics. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon at paytw.com slash fiction only reader. The link is also in the synopsis. Standing near the edge of an opening in the wall, staring down at the floor below, Quinn cracked his neck and stretched his body. He was back into the fourth vault, the underground vault, ready to give the Beelzebub's crawler field down below him yet another chance. For the brave and the bold, huh, he muttered. Yeah, not this time. Saying that, Quinn mounted his broom and flew out of the tunnel. This isn't the aquatic vault. I can fly all I want. He had done his research on Beelzebub's crawlers. They lived underground. Due to that, they could only detect prey through tectonic vibrations in the ground. As such, if Quinn didn't touch the ground, he would go undetected by the vines that could secrete flesh dissolving liquids from their thorns. Quinn flew straight to the wall opposite to him, with the tunnel dug into it. At Quinn's command, the broom flew close and hovered away from the walls and the floor as he studied the tunnel. 
a ball of sharp white light manifested in the air before it rushed across the tunnel, dividing itself into more and more orbs of light that lined up near the top of the tunnel, as in turning the dim pathway into a brightly lit one. He gently lowered himself enough to see straight into the tunnel, while making absolutely sure that not a single part of his body touched the ground. Beelzebub's crawler had a peculiar trait which pushed the vine species to merge or connect with every other vine in the vicinity, thus creating a vast network of them. This meant that if even a single vine came out of the ground to entrap prey, the entire hive network would be aware of its actions. And if that singular vine didn't return with meal, then the more vines would emerge to capture their meal. After peering into the now-lit tunnel, Quinn observed, nothing was sticking out to him as unusual, or to be specific, there was nothing that looked there. It would harm or hinder harm him his current task at hand. After making decisions, Quinn flew into the tunnel with the magical orbs shining much-needed light for him to see. How long does this tunnel go? asked Quinn, looking around as he cautiously made his way through the tunnel while memorizing every scratch and cut on the rugged and dense stone walls, never knew what could come in use afterward. His question was promptly answered as he saw the light at the path's end, making Quinn pick up some speed. He flew out of the tunnel, and with him, the light inside also left, once again leaving the tunnel dark. The tunnel had opened up to another wide area, Quinn flew up to get a good look at the site, and the first thing that caught his eye was that a gigantic portion of the ceiling had broken off and had collapsed down below. Is that marble? Quinn noticed white marble below all the collapsed rubble. He could see it was a truly wide circular platform of marble beneath all the pile-up. He could also see some markings on the marble. Wait a minute. He looked around and saw that there were no more exits other than the one he had entered. Is this it? He uttered. This isn't the end, is it? It can't be, right? That was too short, only one obstacle. Quinn realized that the vault could have been made before brooms became popular and mainstream. The now a common household item, the flying brooms that allowed anyone to fly, were not so commonplace, as once brooms were nothing but causes of splinter-filled buttocks and bulging piles. If his assumption was correct, then Quinn's use of the broom might not have been covered by the original creator. Quinn stared at the ground and conjured a big boulder before dropping it down to the ground. The boulder hit the ground with a large boom and shook the vault room. He waited, but Beelzebub's crawler didn't come out. The vines couldn't differentiate between living and non-living. Is this really it? Hat was so difficult about this, he exclaimed in confusion. Somehow he couldn't get closure with such a simple vault, but well, if I think it like that, then it makes sense. It didn't need to be tough. His thinking had been isolated. He was thinking with just the underground vault and in mind, he had missed the bigger picture. The forbidden forest was all the security one needed to hide something. Dangerous, cut off from the outside world and filled with beings who don't want anything to do with people outside of the forest. There was no need to elaborate vault when the natural surroundings already provided the reliable security one could ask. Bow-slinging centaurs, flesh-hungry acromantulas, brutish trolls, and many more species that had the forest held in its vast biodiverse embrace. Quinn descended down to the ground and dismounted off the broom and sighed as he stared at the rubble in front of him. I guess I'll work with this now, but this is a lot of it. He could see enough pile-up that he could climb it and reach a good height, a height high enough to be considered dangerous to jump down from, without magic. Magic thrummed inside his body as Quinn closed his eyes and concentrated on the rubble in front of him. He reached out to debris in front of him and exerted a lift. Oh, this is heavy, he groaned. His magic groaned. The wreck groaned. Quinn had to raise his hands towards the collapse, just so that his mind could better concentrate the magic into lifting. He opened the tap to his magic entirely and let it flow. His eyes opened, and purple orbs glowed at the wreck. The rubble started to shake as everything started to lift and began to fall to the sides. Just a little more. There was no need to struggle like this. Quinn could shave off all debris bit by bit. But he didn't want to waste time. 
Many hours spread across multiple visits would be spent just to clean the mess from the marble below. Every visit to the Forbidden Forest was essential and vital to Quinn. He had to slot visits to the forest between Quidditch tournament preparation, Project Babel, other development projects, visits to the library, practicing magic to keep his skill up to date, among other things. He was a bit too busy this year. By the end, Quinn was sweat, heaving, and grabbing his knees as his chest heaved up and down. This was clearly not the job for one person, said Quinn, standing up straight. But the result was worth it, as Quinn could see the circular block of marble sitting in the middle of the cave. Quinn walked towards it before climbing up with a hop. Oh, these are runes, aren't they? Quinn could tell at one glance that the deep engravings on the marble were a cluster and network of large-scale runes. There were many classes groups on which runes could be classified. Language, the number of layers, materials, effects, and among those categories, size classification was among the myriads of classifications. The size classification was a scale-based category. It went from small-scale runes to large-scale, in front of Quinn, laid into the marble. To give an example of the importance and use of size classification, a rune inscribed on a small wooden chip would be significantly weaker than one carved into a big piece of wood. Quinn, himself, specialized in small-scaled runes as he liked to create articles that were potable in nature and could be carried with him. Recon was such an example. Ironically, Quinn's most notable achievement, Magifax, which, even though employed small-scale rube inscription in its receivers, worked primarily through large-scale runes. Magifax devices need a network to work, and that network was built through transmitting hubs spread throughout the globe. Those transmitting hubs were large-scaled rune applications. On West-owned properties throughout the world, unique buildings were constructed, and inside those buildings, every majority usable surface was etched with giant runes that connected every registered Magifax device on the planet. Quinwall, Ket on the marble, studying the runes, and after a while, he declared, yeah, no idea what this does. Right from the start, there were a few problems. First, the runes were complex and needed to be mapped out before Quinn could even start studying. Second, Quinn had to check if there were runes beneath the surface, as not all runes were required to be out on the surface. And third, the ceiling collapse broke the marble, said Quinn, clicking his tongue. There were several cracks and crevices throughout the marble, essentially making the rune structure useless. I need to get it fixed, said Quinn and touched one of those cracks. I can't use the mending charm, Reparo, here. Can I? If it was an ordinary platform of marble, Quinn could have fixed all the cracks and crevices with a single snap of his magic, but the marble held so many runes that if he carelessly used the mending charm to fix things, it would break the subtle and meticulously placed connections. Quinn sat down on the marble and sighed, This is going to require a lot of work. Ugh, I don't even know what I'll get in the end. He looked up at the ceiling blamingly. Why did you have to fall down? If you didn't, I would be having fun right now. He sighed at his lousy luck before a thought struck his mind. The sunken crypt. The wolves names the vault as such, didn't they? Does that mean their territory is just above here? Huh, maybe I'm right. Nice, I will check it out later. Finally, after sitting in the dust, Quinn got up, dusted himself, took out a small notepad and pen from his pockets, and got ready to note the runes day. Hmm, I predict that this is a way to communicate to the aliens, I call it. And with that, he got to work. Snow was still thick upon the grounds, and the greenhouse windows were covered in condensation so thick that they couldn't see out of them in herbology. Nobody was looking forward to care of magical creatures much in this weather, though as Marcus said, the fire beetles would probably warm them up nicely, either by chasing them or flamethrowing so forcefully that Hagrid's cabin would catch fire. However, when the Ravenclaw trio arrived at Hagrid's cabin, they found an elderly witch with closely cropped gray hair and a prominent chin standing before his front door. Hurry up now, the bell is about to ring, she barked at them as they struggled toward her through the snow. Who are you, said Eddie, staring at her. Where's Hagrid? My name is Professor Grubbly Plank, she said briskly. I am your temporary care of magical creatures teacher. Where's Hagrid? repeated someone loudly. 
He is indisposed, said Professor Grubbly Plank shortly. Soft and unpleasant laughter reached the students' ears. They turned, and the rest of the Slytherins were joining the class. All of them looked gleeful, and none of them looked surprised to see Professor Grubbly Plank. This way, please, said Professor Grubbly Plank, and she strode off around the paddock where the Beau Baton's horses were shivering. Quinn, Marcus, and Eddie followed her, looking back over their shoulders at Hagrid's cabin. All the curtains were closed. Was Hagrid in there, alone and ill? What's wrong with Hagrid? Marcus said, hurrying to catch up with Professor Grubbly Plank. What do you reckon is wrong with him? You don't think one of those scroot that the fourth years are studying, speculated Eddie. Quinn glanced at his two friends and injected, You two should get into the habit of reading the newspaper. It's on the front page of the Daily Prophet. He put a hand into his attached pockets, pulled out a newspaper, and handed it to Marcus. You keep newspapers in your pocket, said Eddie. I read a couple of them and can't read them all during the breakfast. Daily Prophet always gets left out, so it tends to end up in my market. Marcus unfolded the paper and read it, with Eddie looking over his shoulder. It was an article topped with a picture of Hagrid looking extremely shifty. Dumbledore's giant mistake. Albus Dumbledore, the eccentric headmaster of Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, has never been afraid to make controversial staff appointments, writes Rita Skeeter, special correspondent. In September of this year, he hired Alastair Mad-Eye Moody, the notoriously jinx-happy ex-Auror, to teach Defense Against the Dark Arts, a decision that caused many raised eyebrows at the Ministry of Magic, given Moody's well-known habit of attacking anybody who makes a sudden movement in his presence. Mad-Eye Moody, however, looks responsible and kindly when set beside the part human Dumbledore employs to teach care of magical creatures. Rubius Hagrid, who admits to being expelled from Hogwarts in his third year, has enjoyed the position of gamekeeper at the school ever since a job secured for him by Dumbledore. Last year, however, Hagrid used his mysterious influence over the headmaster to secure the additional post of care of magical creatures teacher over the heads of many better qualified candidates. An alarmingly large and ferocious-looking man, Hagrid has been using his newfound authority to terrify the students in his care with a succession of horrific creatures. While Dumbledore turns a blind eye, Hagrid has maimed several pupils during a series of lessons that many admit to being very frightening. I was attacked by a hippogriff, and my friend Vincent Crabbe got a bad bite off a flobberworm, says Draco Malfoy, a fourth-year student. We all hate Hagrid, but we're just too scared to say anything. Hagrid has no intention of ceasing his campaign of intimidation, however. Last month, in conversation with a Daily Prophet reporter, he admitted breeding creatures he has dubbed blast-ended scroots, highly dangerous crosses between manticores and fire crabs. Of course, the creation of new breeds of magical creatures is an activity usually closely observed by the Department for the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures. Hagrid, however, considers himself to be above such petty restrictions. I was just having some fun, he says, before hastily changing the subject. As if this were not enough, the Daily Prophet has now unearthed evidence that Hagrid is not, as he has always pretended, a pure-blood wizard. He is not, in fact, even pure human. His mother, we can exclusively reveal, is none other than the giantess Fridwolfa, whose whereabouts are currently unknown. Bloodthirsty and brutal, the giants brought themselves to the point of extinction by warring amongst themselves during the last century. The handful that remained joined the ranks of he who must not be named and were responsible for some of the worst mass muggle killings of his reign of terror. While many of the giants who served he who must not be named were killed by Aurors working against the dark side, Fridwolfa was not among them. It is possible she escaped to one of the giant communities still existing in foreign mountain ranges. If his antics during care of magical creatures lessons are any guide, however, Fridwolfa's son appears to have inherited her brutal nature. In a bizarre twist, Hagrid is reputed to have developed a close friendship with the boy who brought around You-Know-Who's fall from power, thereby driving Hagrid's own mother like the rest of You-Know-Who's supporters into hiding. Perhaps Harry Potter is unaware of the unpleasant truth about his large friend, 
but Albus Dumbledore indeed has a duty to ensure that Harry Potter, along with his fellow students, is warned about the dangers of associating with part giants. Marcus finished reading and looked up at Eddie, whose mouth was hanging open. When Quinn saw that he asked, You didn't think he was just a big guy, did you? Eh, said Eddie. Ahem. Of course not. I knew that, yeah. Don't worry, people really think he just has big bones, said Quinn, as he got the paper back. But you got to admit, Skeeter sure has excellent writing skills. She expertly painted the specific picture that she wanted. That's what you get from this, said Marcus, raising G his brow. The article doesn't matter, shrugged Quinn. Hagrid has been here since he got expelled. Hagrid is around 50, you know. He was here as the gamekeeper when your parents studied at Hogwarts. They know Hagrid personally. A lot of them know what Hagrid is really like, so this article might be tough for a while, but support will shine through. But how did she know? asked Eddie. Quinn shrugged, but he knew the answer. She probably was here on the Yule Ball. He hadn't checked recon on that day, and even if he did, Quinn wouldn't have checked for Skeeter. She wouldn't write about him. But he did have some circumstantial proof about Skeeter's presence. She might have listened to Hagrid and Olympe Maxime's conversation, thought Quinn, thinking about the angry headmistress on that day, pulling Fleur with her. Skeeter must have listened to their conversation. Though I did warn her about being careful about fluttering at Hogwarts, it seems she didn't get the point, thought Quinn, and hummed as the new professor proceeded to lead them towards today's subject. Oh, unicorns! Nice, he exclaimed happily, and the somewhat threatening thoughts were thrown at the back of his head. Quinn West, MC. I have a need. Need for four. Fill in the blank. Hagrid, half-giant. Suddenly, a topic of discussion. Rita Skeeter, reporter. She knows her craft. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction, or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression. Move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 176, Bagman, Skeeter, and Hostage Candidate. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon at .patreon.com slash fictiononlyreader. The link is also in the synopsis. There was a Hogsmeade visit halfway through January, and as most Hogwarts students, Quinn was going out of the castle to the all-magical village of Hogsmeade. Quinn, Marcus, and Eddie left the castle together on Saturday and set off through the cold, wet grounds toward the gates. As they passed the Durmstrang ship moored in the lake, they saw Victor Krum emerge onto the deck, dressed in nothing but swimming trunks. He was very well built indeed, and as tough as he looked because he climbed up onto the side of the ship, stretched out his arms, and dived right into the lake. He's mad, said Eddie, staring at Krum's dark head as it bobbed out into the middle of the lake. It must be freezing. It's January. It's a lot colder where he comes from, said Marcus. But still, going swimming in mid-January is a bit too much. Eh, it's not that cold, shrugged Quinn. It's quite pleasant, actually. If you're sleepy, it'll wake you up. A dip in the winter is great for when you're feeling lethargic. The two looked at Quinn as if he had grown a third head, collectively ignore his asinine advice. Eddie turned to Marcus and replied to his last statement. Yeah, but there's still the giant squid. He didn't sound anxious. If anything, he sounded hopeful. His team, trolling boogies, after their first loss to Crumb's treacherous barons, hadn't lost a single game. In fact, they had blown the competition away, going as far as to win by double score margins. Quinn roamed his eyes around the snowy hogsmeade, and peculiarly he caught a glance of a few goblins before they turned a corner. It wasn't that goblins weren't allowed in hogsmeade, just they were rare to be seen in the village and preferred staying in the underground city that they had built under and around Gringotts. Marcus suggested a visit to the three broomsticks to start off the weekend, and that's what they did. The pub was as crowded as ever. Adults, students, residents, passerbys, Everyone was enjoying the lively ambience of the merry bar. At the bar, the lovely Madame Rosmerta turned away from her various suitors to take orders from the three. Welcome, boys. What can I get for you today? One large butterbeer, replied Eddie, placing the coins on the table. Same for me, please, said Marcus, getting the money from his pouch wallet. Madame Rosmerta counted the coins and nodded, 
All right, two large butterbeers coming up, she turned to Quinn and asked. What about you? One vanilla milkshake with a large scoop of butterscotch and shaved chocolate on the top, please, said Quinn, reciting his order. How much would that be? I want a large serving as well. Eddie, Marcus, and Rosmerta didn't show any reaction to Quinn's order. His two friends were used to the variety of drinks that Quinn ordered every time they came to Hogsmeade, and Quinn had left an impression on Rosmerta because he had ever only ordered a butterbeer once, and after that time, Quinn's orders were always like his current one. Three sickles, she asked, which Quinn paid. As Madame Rosmerta remembered Quinn, she also knew his habits. Your mug. Quinn always handed her a conjured mug to carry his drinks around with him. Quinn smiled, and instead of conjuring a mug as she was expecting, he took out a wooden tankard from his robes. Please, make the drink in this. Rosmerta's surprised hands received the tankard as her eyes switched between Quinn and the tankard in her hands before she finally went to fix up the drinks. On the side, Eddie was grinning. The tankard was his Christmas gift to Quinn, after all. Hey, why didn't Luna come with us? asked Eddie. Quinn stared around the bar and the people as he answered. She is spending time with her other friend. Eh? Who? Marcus answered as he arrived with his and Eddie's butterbeers. You don't know? She has been spending tea, me with Astoria. Astoria? Astoria Greengrass, as in Daphne's sister? said Eddie, taking his large butterbeer. Yeah, somehow, both of them are friends now. As Marcus and Eddie were talking, Quinn was looking into the mirror behind the bar and saw Ludo Bagman, reflected there, sitting in a shadowy corner with a bunch of goblins. Bagman was talking very fast in a low voice to the goblins, all of whom had their arms crossed and looked rather menacing. It was indeed odd, Quinn thought, that Bagman was here at the Three Broomsticks on a weekend when there was no Triwizard event and therefore no judging to be done. He watched Bagman in the mirror. He was looking as if he was trying to convince the goblin of something. Ah, I get it now, thought Quinn. He received his shake from Madame Rosmerta before telling Eddie and Marcus, I'll be back in a bit. Then he walked towards the shady corners, towards Bagman. Gentlemen, greeted Quinn as he sat down with them like they were all friends, and he was totally supposed to be there. What a lovely day we have today. The snow is particularly lovely and glowing today. Having a cold drink like the one I'm having has a unique charm. You should try it out. Q. Quinn, stuttered Bagman, and even in the cold he started to sweat as his heart began to beat faster. What are you doing here? Quinn didn't reply immediately. Instead, he stared into Bagman's eyes and reached out inside. Ah, as I feared, he's an addict. No, he's worse. He's an idiot. Mr. Bagman, before you say anything else, I know what you're trying to do here, sighed Quinn. We talked about this when I generously decided to provide you with some much-needed help. I warned you what would happen if you tried to do exactly this. And, no, you've got all this wrong, sputtered Bagman. I wasn't. A goblin cut Bagman off. Who are you? Quinn glanced at the goblin, scooped up a spoonful of ice cream, and ate it. Quinn West. The four goblins, dressed in heavy robes, twitched at the mention of his names. West, one goblin replied with a guttural voice. I remember. You're the one who has a student vault with us. The only West coin we have in Gringotts. Yes, smiled Quinn, continuing to drink and eat. I'm also the one who paid Mr. Bagman's debt, and I would suggest that you don't lend him more money. That's between us and Ludo Bagman. You're not to interfere in our business. Quinn watched the toothy goblin, showing their sharp teeth, and shrugged. Okay. I will take a guess about what is happening here. Mr. Bagman here is trying to convince you to lend him some money, which you're hesitant to do because his past record with Gringotts isn't particularly spotless. But Mr. Bagman assures you that he'll pay you back on time. Bagman wasn't even looking up right now. He had his eyes squeezed close, his head bowed down. You see, the reason behind Mr. Bagman's confidence is that he plans to put his money once again into gambling, just like last time. This time around, he was going to put his money into the very lucrative Quidditch tournament happening around right now. Quinn's initial plan had been to keep the betting system inside Hogwarts and for the Hogwarts student. The Weasley twins had other ideas. Around the third week, they started expanded to the people in the stands, and when the fifth week rolled around, they came to Quinn 
and suggested that they open up the betting to anyone who wanted to bet. Their problem was that they didn't have the capital for the expansion. It took a lot of cash and liquidity to match the bets and keep a betting operational. Moreover, they didn't have the knowledge on how to work something of that level. Fortunately for them, Quinn was ambitious and liked the idea. Furthermore, he had his head crammed with business knowledge from George West, Elliot Dalton, and Leah West, liquefied gems of wisdom, and had the money to back everything up. And I'm sure you fine gentlemen must know who run the Hogwarts Quidditch betting scene, he pointed at himself. I do. As such, I decide who gets to bet, and I have placed strict orders that Mr. Bagman is not to be allowed to place any bets. Quinn stared up into Bagman's round, rosy face and his wide, baby blue eyes. But it seems that he has employed another to do his bidding. I thought of this happening, in fact, expected it, but sincerely hoped that he won't go down that path. I. Around that time, Rita Skeeter had just entered. She was wearing banana yellow robes today. Her long nails were painted shocking pink, and she was accompanied by her paunchy photographer. She bought drinks, and she and the photographer made their way through the crowds to a table nearby. Then, she noticed Ludo Bagman, a bunch of goblins, and Quinn West sitting in a shady corner. Bozo, what's Bagman? What's he doing with a pack of goblins in tow? Showing them the sights. What nonsense. He was always a bad liar. Reckon something's up? Think we should do a bit of digging. And why is Quinn West sitting with them? Come on, let's go talk to them. A friendly chat, you know? She, with her trusty photography, marched towards the corner and with a brilliant smile and shrill voice, spoke. Bagman, what a surprise to see you here. Go away, Miss Skeeter. You're not required here, said Quinn without looking at the reporter. Rita Skeeter's smile flickered very slightly, but she hitched it back almost at once. She snapped open her crocodile skin handbag, pulled out her quick quotes quill. Ah, Quinn, I didn't see you there. Miss Skeeter, why are you still here? asked Quinn, finally glancing at the woman. Rita's eyes hardening as they fell on Quinn. Quinn, seeing you with Ludo Bagman is a surprise. I know things about Ludo Bagman that would make your hair curl. She tried to garner some favor. If Ludo Bagman was scared before, he was more scared now. Rita Skeeter was like a blood-smelling hound who wouldn't let go of a scoop if she could smell one. And right now, she was trying to garner favor with Quinn. Quinn sighed once again. Miss Skeeter, can I talk to you for a second? Rita made Bozo stay behind as she followed Quinn to another corner. Yes, Quinn, what is it? Do you want to know about Bagman because I have a lot of things I can... Miss Skeeter, Quinn stopped her. I knew about your little secret before I even met you. Don't you think I would know Mr. Bagman's dirty little secrets? I know what he did during the war, what he's doing now, and what he's going to do in the future. He took a pause before finally stating, Miss Skeeter, you don't have to do this. All I desire from you is to not cross paths with me. If you can do that, I'll not come in your path if you do that, and we both will go out merry ways. Quinn understood that if he wanted, he could use Rita Skeeter as a very useful asset. But Quinn didn't want to deal with Rita Skeeter as he had too much on his plate to keep tabs on what she was doing, and Rita Skeeter was like a viper, and if he gave her a chance, she would bite him. He was a hundred percent sure that if he asked Rita Skeeter to do something, she would try to find something that would put Quinn at a disadvantage. Do you understand me? Rita's quill hand went down, and she nodded silently. Good, then. I wish you a pleasant day. He walked back to the goblin table, and as he sat down, he addressed Bozo, the photographer. You can go now. Miss Skeeter is calling for you. Bozo seemed confused as this wasn't how things usually went. His partner, Boss, would usually be smiling with the other party sweating. He walked away feeling very perplexed. Now, where were we? asked Quinn. Ah, yes, as I was saying, if you want to make a loss, then go ahead, be my guest, lend him money because Mr. Pa Bagman isn't going to be doing any Quidditch betting, but maybe this better. Maybe he will use that money somewhere useful. The goblins had heard enough. They looked at each other before getting up and walking out of the bar. They didn't even look at Bagman before leaving. Mr. Bagman, I don't care what T you do after the tournament, but before it, I don't want any problems from you. Even now, it won't cause me any harm if I let you do whatever you want. But tell me, 
What was our deal? If I give you the hosting job and stay out of trouble till the tournament, you'll pay off my debts, replied Bagman. Exactly, said Quinn, finally finishing his milkshake. I'll let it go this time, but next time around, I won't be so lenient. You may take this any way you want to or can. Quinn got up, gave Bagman one last look before leaving. His job as the host of the Tri-Wizard Tournament was directly tied to Ludo Bagman being on the judging panel. If somehow Bagman managed to get himself booted, then Quinn's host duties might come into jeopardy and he would have to do extra work to keep that job. As he walked back towards the bar, he saw the Weasley twins enter the pub. Fred, George, here. Yeah, what is it? Quinn pointed at Bagman, sulking in the corner, and muttered, Mr. Bagman, there was trying to place some bets. I've talked to them, but if he does come to you, don't let him come to place some bets, not even if he agrees to pay both of you back for the galleons he took from at the World Cup. How did you? Never mind, the twins sighed. Okay, we will make sure that. He doesn't place any bets with us. Good, nodded Quinn, satisfied. Also, Bagman is using a couple students to place his bets. I'll be sending those names, so make sure they are banned for a couple of games. He had gleaned off the information right from the source. Roger. When Quinn joined his friends back, Marcus asked, What was that about? Oh, you know, business as usual, Quinn replied before calling out to the hostess. Madame Rosmerda, one hot chocolate, please. So, will you do it? Quinn stared at the five adults in front of him and pretended to ponder the question he just asked. You're asking me if I would be fine being put into an enchanted sleep and then spend a couple of hours inside the freezing waters of the Great Lake in February. Albus nodded, as if it was a commonplace request. Yes, that's about right. Hmm, I see, nodded Quinn. While I would love to volunteer for this exciting opportunity, I've hosting responsibilities that I need to attend, so I'm unfortunately not available. In the headmaster's office, Quinn sat with the three heads of schools, Flitwick and Barty Crouch Sr. Mr. West, started Crouch, I assure you that you'll be absolutely safe. Professor Dumbledore has communicated with the Mer people, and they will make sure that you'll not be harmed down while you're sleeping. Quinn, of course, wasn't worried about being harmed, certainly not underwater. That was probably the safest place for him. I understand that, Mr. Crouch, and I've full trust in the measures taken, but I've things planned for the second task. Mr. Bagman and I've been in regular contact, preparing just for this task. And what might those preparations be? asked Maxime. That you'll see on the day itself, smiled Quinn before asking back. Is there no else you can ask to be Fleur's hostage? Like one of your students, someone close to her, maybe. Well, Fleur's younger sister just arrived as the second batch of students from Beaubatons. We can have her go under the lake. But I'm a little hesitant about putting someone as young as her in the lake so soon after she gets here. Quinn groaned internally. Not audibly, of course. It was true that Gabrielle Delacour was dangerously young to be put under the lake, and looking at it, he should volunteer for it. Fleur was his friend, and she would definitely not like it when she found that her sister was put inside the lake. Especially not when the egg riddle states that they would lose those hostages after an hour. Not a thing to be happy about. Ah, whatever. I should just do it. There's no harm done to me anyway, thought Quinn. I could probably break from the enchanted sleep if I try hard enough. It'll be a good opportunity. Needy to see how well I can do against Dumbledore's magic. But what would I do while tied up down there? Not that I can talk mere speak. Ah, I should speak up first. But before he could, Olymp spoke up. Quinn, are you dating Fleur? Quinn, who was about to speak, closed his mouth at the sudden question before opening it again. No, I'm not. Why? All right, it's decided then. Little Gabrielle will go inside. I think having her sister down there will be a greater motivation for Fleur, increasing her chances to win. That's one way to think about, I guess, said Quinn. He was a little taken aback by the reasoning, but he could see it working. If someone put Leah under the lake, Quinn would literally tear the lake apart to get to her. This is over then, said Karakoff, sounding bored mixed with a bit of irritation. Everyone's hostages are decided. Three of them are already put into sleep for tomorrow. We just need to get that little girl down there. Oh, who are the other three? 
asked Quinn. Dumbledore answered Quinn, Miss Ivy Potter for her brother Harry Potter, Miss Cho Chang for Cedric Diggory, and finally, Miss Daphne Greengrass for Victor Crumb. Quinn's brow twitched at the mention of Daphne going into the lake. He knew that she would be going inside, but still hearing it now bothered him a little. Crumb better come first in this round, thought Quinn, and Ivy instead of Hermione looks like I was wrong. Well, Sister Trump's date, I guess, and Lily Potter must know about the real situation. Great to know, he said. I'll use that info while hosting. He was going to put on a show tomorrow morning. Quinn West, MC, MC, investor, consultant, hostage candidate. Ludo Bagman, gambling addict, working under strict terms. Rita Skeeter, journalist, sometimes being bold pays off, sometimes it doesn't. Goblins, profit-seeking, the West name subconsciously makes them snarl. Weasley twins, betting kings, learning the ways to run an operation. Fiction-only reader, author, day one of four of end terms is over, two out of eight subjects are done, three days and six subjects more to go. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction, or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 177, Second Task, Project Drone Vision. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon and want the w.com slash fiction only reader. The link is also in the synopsis. The entrance hall contained a few last minute stragglers, all leaving the great hall after breakfast and heading through the double oak doors to watch the second task. They stared as Harry flashed past, sending Colin and Dennis Creevy flying as he leaped down the stone steps and out onto the bright, chilly grounds. As he pounded down the lawn, Harry saw the seats from the first task Dragon Stadium in November were now ranged along the opposite bank, rising in stands built over the water of the Great Lake that was packed to the bursting point and reflected in the lake below. The excited babble of the crowd echoed strangely across the water as Harry ran flat out around the other side of the lake toward the judges, who were sitting at another gold-draped table at the water's edge. Cedric, Fleur, and Crumb were beside the judges' table, watching Harry sprint toward them. I'm here. Harry panted, skidding to a halt in the mud and accidentally splattering Fleur's robes. Where have you been, Mr. Potter? said an authoritative, disapproving voice. The task's about to start. Harry looked around. McGonagall was looking at him disappointedly and a little angrily. Now, now, Professor McGonagall, said Ludo Bagman, who was looking intensely jolly to see Harry. Let him catch his breath. Dumbledore smiled at Harry, but Karkaroff and Madame Maxime didn't look at all pleased to see him. It was evident from the looks on their faces that they had thought he wasn't going to turn up. Harry bent over, hands on his knees, gasping for breath. He had a stitch in his side that felt as though he had a knife between his ribs, but there was no time to get rid of it. Ludo Bagman was now moving among the champions, spacing them along the bank at intervals of ten feet. Harry was on the very end of the line, next to Crumb, who was wearing swimming trunks and was holding his wand ready. All right, Harry, Bagman whispered as he moved Harry a few feet farther away from Crumb. Know what you're going to do? Yeah, Harry panted, massaging his ribs. The preparations for the task had caused him to be a little late, a little too late. Bagman gave Harry's shoulder a quick squeeze and returned to the judge's table, he pointed his wand at his throat, as he had done at the World Cup, said, Sonorous, and his voice boomed out across the dark water toward the stands. Well, all our champions are ready for the second task. I won't waste any more of your time and pass it on to Quinn West for him to continue the task. The stands were built above the lake, supported by vertical beams holding them above the surface. As such, there was a good amount of space between the seating area and the lake. From that gap below, the students saw Quinn coming out, and it set them lit in murmurs and discussion. Hermione and Ron were sitting with Lily Potter to support their friend's mother because they knew that Ivy was under the lake and Harry was about to go inside. As Hermione watched Quinn enter their sight, she elbowed Ron in the sides, hitting him in the ribs. Is he walking on water? Ron was so engrossed to see Quinn walk on water that he could only nod his head. But Lily Potter did confirm Hermione's question. Yes, dear. Quinn is walking on water. 
Quinn walked a little distance on the water to the point where he didn't have to feel uncomfortable craning his neck to look at everyone in the stands. Be honest, he started looking at everyone with a smile. You're thinking how I'm doing this, aren't you? There were many yeses from the crowd, and Quinn could see a lot of necks craning and students standing up to get a better look at him. Being honest myself, I'm pretty cool right now. He hopped on the water a couple times, showing that there was no trick here, and he was indeed solidly standing on water. It wasn't that D.I. difficult to walk on water, an intermediatory water spell, and anyone could replicate what Quinn was doing right now. The wow factor was because no one did it, and because walking on water was an action tied closely to Jesus Christ, and religion was popular everywhere, be it magical or non-magical. Look at Friar. He was a cleric monk when he was alive, and even after his death, he was a devout practitioner of his religion. Quinn smiled at the nods he received from the crowd and was about to continue when he felt a tremor beneath his feet. His smile cramped for a second. He raised his right foot and tapped it on the water, sending tremors back into the lake, hidden from everyone looking at him. Ahem, I'm sure, since November, all of you must have heard at least one or a couple theories about the second task, all kind of speculations and conjectures in our beloved Hogwarts rumor mill, tingling curiosities up and down the castles. Another water tremor came back to him, and the Kraken, who was looking to play, fight, replied back sulkily at Quinn's refusal water tremors. All right, not that's over with. He spread his arms wide and continued. Now, as we stand here, on the Great Lake, all of you must have some inkling about the task. At least that it's water-related. He glanced at the champion standing at a separate platform. The champions know what they have to do and what is at stake here. The first task was all about them, but this time around, it's not just themselves they have to worry about. This time around, there are more things on the line. All four champions displayed a different level of nervousness as they stood staring at the lake. All four knew what Quinn was talking about. Before I move on, I would start the task and get our champions working, said Quinn taking out a small white sphere with red veins all around. He dropped the sphere into the water. I'm sure they're eager to get inside there and start their task. Before they actually go in, I can only share a couple of things. They have precisely an hour to recover what has been taken from them. But before they go, I would like you to introduce all of you and them to what we're going to for the hour they're inside. He closed his right eye and raised his fake wand to the sky. Once again, like the first task, the light bent in the sky, and a vast illusion of an underwater scene. This is the live feed of what's happening inside the Great Lake. There won't be much to do for the hour the champions are underwater, so we will be watching them from here. Quinn still had his right eye closed, and that was because his right eye was currently connected to the sphere he had dropped underwater. An artificial eye that he had planned and researched since his second year, Chapter 61, and had been actively building since this year, Chapter 140. In Project Drone Vision, Quinn's right eye's vision was cut, and his optic nerves that connected his eyes to the brain were magically getting optical signals from the artificial eye. The artificial eye was covered with a protective coating of an air bubble that kept it separated from the water. He could literally see what the artificial eye was catching. It was a little disorienting to see two completely different scenes, but he had gotten used to it. Now, champions, on the count of three, the countdown starts then. One, two, three, start! The whistle echoed shrilly in the cold, still air. The stands erupted with cheers and applause. Without looking to see what the other champions were doing, Harry pulled off his shoes and socks, pulled a vial of moss green potion out of his pocket, stuffed it into his mouth, and waded out into the lake. He had drunk a gillyweed potion that he and Hermione had brewed together. Harry clapped his hands around his throat and felt two large slits just below his ears, flapping in the cold air. Quinn had gills. Without pausing to think, he did the only thing that made sense. He dove deep inside the lake to get his twin out. Victor Crumb cracked here, snack, as he pulled out his wand and pointed it towards his head. The action made Quinn furrow his brow a little. He knew what was about to come. 
partial transfiguration around the head area was a tricky thing, and Quinn wasn't sure if the pro-seeker was adept enough to safely pull it off. Victor's head twisted into a shark head with jagged teeth and beady eyes. And just like the originals, Cedric and Fleur used bubble head charms to filter the air out of the water to provide them oxygen underwater before they dove inside to rescue her girlfriend and little sister. It was a charm that Quinn didn't use underwater, but when he had to deal with potions that released toxic fumes during brewing. Ah, these guys have it so easy, thought Quinn and exhaled a big sigh, as plenty of memories of being pushed around in the water, being lost in darkness, being cut, among other things like being smacked around by giant tentacles flashed inside his mind. Quinn shook his head and pulled himself out of the flashbacks. Yeah, so easy. Now that the champions are inside, let's see how they're doing. The illusion overhead changed as the eye moved. They could only see ten feet ahead, so that as the eye sped through the water, new scenes seemed to loom suddenly out of the oncoming darkness. Forests of rippling, tangled black weed, vast plains of mud littered with dull, glimmering stones. First, they saw Cedric swimming freely, but the very next second, his ankles were grabbed a grindylo, a tiny horned water demon, poking out of the weed, its long fingers clutched tightly around Cedric's leg, its pointed fangs bared. Cedric stuck his hand quickly inside his robes and fumbled for his wand. By the time he had grasped it, two more grindylos had risen out of the weed, had seized handfuls of Cedric's clothes, and were attempting to drag him down. Sparkles shot from his wand, and the grindylos were pelted with what seemed to be jets of hot water, for where it struck them, angry red patches appeared on their green skin. Cedric pulled his ankle out of the grindylos' grip and swam as fast as he could, occasionally sending more jets of hot water over his shoulder at random. Every now and then, he felt one of the grindylos snatch at his foot again, and he kicked out, hard. Finally, he felt his foot connect with a horned skull, and looking back, saw the dazed grindylo floating away, cross-eyed, while its fellows shook their fists at Cedric and sank back into the weed. Grendliows were a little blip, but it seems that Cedric is doing well. Let's move on to another champion. His commentary wasn't needed as people were a little too engrossed in the visuals. The eye moved, and soon they saw a large rock emerge out of the muddy water ahead. It had paintings of merpeople on it. They carried spears and chased what looked like the giant squid. A cluster of crude stone dwellings, stained with algae, loomed suddenly out of the gloom on all sides. Here and there at the dark windows, everyone saw faces, faces that bore no resemblance at all to the painting of the mermaid in the prefect's bathroom. The merpeople had grayish skin and long, wild, dark green hair. Their eyes were yellow, as were their broken teeth, and they wore thick ropes of pebbles around their necks. They leered at Harry Potter as he swam past. One or two of them emerged from their caves to watch him better, their powerful, silverfish tails beating the water, spears clutched in their hands. Harry sped on, staring around, and soon the dwellings became more numerous. There were gardens of weed around some of them, and he even saw a pet grendolo tied to a stake outside one door. Merpeople were emerging on all sides now, watching him eagerly, pointing at his webbed hands and gills, talking behind their hands to one another. Harry sped around a corner, and an extraordinary sight met his eyes. A whole crowd of merpeople was floating in front of the houses that lined what looked like a mer version of a village square. A choir of merpeople was singing in the middle, calling the champions toward them, and behind them rose a crude sort of statue, a gigantic merperson hewn from a boulder. Four people were bound tightly to the tail of the stone merperson. Ivy was tied between Daphne and Cho. There was also a girl who looked no older than eight, whose clouds of silvery hair made everyone feel sure that she was Fleur Delacour's sister, Gabrielle Delacour. All four of them appeared to be in a very deep sleep. Their heads were lolling onto their shoulders, and fine streams of bubbles kept issuing from their mouths. Ah, Victor Crumb is here, said Quinn, as he, a half-shark, half-man, entered the illusion above. Victor Crumb sped toward the hostages half expecting the merpeople to lower their spears and charge at him, but they did nothing. The ropes of weed tying the hostages to the statue were thick, slimy, and very strong. He looked around, 
Many of the merpeople surrounding them were carrying spears. He swam swiftly toward a seven-foot-tall merman with a long green beard and a choker of shark fangs and tried to mime a request to borrow the spear. The merman laughed and shook his head. Victor roared fiercely, but only bubbles issued from his mouth, and he tried to pull the spear away from the merman, but the merman yanked it back, still shaking his head and laughing. Harry was watching the entire thing from the side while keeping an eye on Ivy. He swirled around, staring about. Something sharp. Anything. Rocks were littering the lake bottom. He dived and snatched up a particularly jagged one and returned to the statue. He began to hack at the ropes binding Ivy, and after several minutes' hard work they broke apart. Ivy floated, unconscious, a few inches above the lake bottom, drifting a little in the ebb of the water. Harry looked around and saw that the shark man swam straight to Daphne and began snapping and biting at her ropes. The trouble was as that Crumb's new teeth were positioned very awkwardly for grinding anything smaller than a dolphin, and Harry was quite sure that if Crumb wasn't careful, he was going to rip Daphne in half. He looked at Ivy before turning to Daphne. He knew that while his sister and Daphne fought a lot, but once they had been very close, close enough that if Ivy was awake right now, she would help Daphne right now. Darting forward, Harry struck Crumb on the shoulder and held up the jagged stone. Crumb seized it and began to cut Daphne free. Within seconds, he had done it. He grabbed Daphne around the waist and without a backward glance, began to rise rapidly with her toward the surface. Now what? Harry thought. Fleur's Delacour sister looked a little too young to be here, and she was looking a little green. But after thinking for a while, he decided to leave. Fleur had done better than everyone else in the first task, better than him, and she had used pure magic and not other skills like flying like he had. She would be here soon, he thought, and took off. And as Harry swam away, he saw Cedric swim past him towards the merperson stone statue. Cedric reached the statue, and now the merpeople were standing close to Cho and Gabrielle. Cedric pulled his wand out. Get out of my way! Only bubbles flew out of his bubble head cover, but he had a distinct impression that the merman had understood him because they suddenly stopped laughing. Their yellowish eyes were fixed upon Harry's wand, and they looked cautious. They moved away, giving Cedric space, who immediately shot a slicing hex at the thick bindings, freeing Cho. All right, three hostages have been freed, with only one remaining. Let's see how the fourth missing champion is doing. Now, we just have to find where she is. Quinn felt sonar tremors into the lake, and eventually, he got the feedback. He had found her. The artificial eye immediately trod water, and the scene everyone saw what was Fleur Delacour up to. Ah, so this is where she was. Fleur Delacour was wrapped up in black weeds. They were tightly wound around her arms, legs, and torso. The black weeds weren't attached to the sogro. Ill butt were broken and their other ends were held by multiple toothy grindelows who were pulling the weedy ropes while Fleur struggled. But the little demon's gang work was a little too strong for Fleur. It seems that Fleur has lost her wand, commented Quinn, and the illusion zoomed into the wand sitting down at the lake bed. Suddenly, Fleur directly looked at the camera, and she mouthed out words frantically. While others weren't able to understand the words, Quinn could as he read her lips. She was begging for Quinn, specifically to rescue her sister, and that there wasn't much time left. Quinn, of course, knew that Gabrielle wasn't in any danger, she would be pulled out at the end of the hour. But then he saw something that concerned him a lot. Fleur's figure and face were slightly shifting. She is shifting into her avian form. Fleur was panicking. From his talks with Fleur and his reading, Quinn knew that in their avian form, Velas weren't able to control magic properly. If she fully transformed, then there were solid chances that her bubblehead charms would pop, and then... Ah, damn it. Quinn West, MC, Human, Wizard Magical, Projector Drone. Champions, four people, doing their thing. Hostages, four people, doing nothing. Fiction-only reader author, inspired by Gara's Sandai. Fiction-only reader author update, day two of four of end terms is over. Four out of eight subjects are done. Halfway through. There won't be chapter tomorrow as I need to prep. Actually, this was supposed to drop tomorrow, but I completed the latest chapter early, so here you go.
If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 178, Rescuing the Damsel If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon at payatpeon.com pay slash fiction only reader. The link is also in the synopsis. Quinn closed both of his eyes, and now all he could see was the scene transmitted by the artificial eye from Project Drone Vision. In the originals, Fleur had somewhat gone through the same thing, and in that time, she had come out without any major mishaps. While the situation had changed this time around, the three champions had gotten to their hostages without much hassle or problems, but that didn't mean Fleur would come out unharmed as well. He contemplated his next move, and with the loud discussions from Stans, made him think that he needed to make a discussion very soon. He opened his left unconnected eye to see the judge's reactions, and saw that Dumbledore, Bagman, Karkaroff, and Crouch all were looking at his overhead illusion, but other than the low varying level of worries, all men looked otherwise unbothered. It was only Olymp Maxime who looked genuinely anxious about her champion's condition. Fleur's unheard words were still sounding loud in his ears. Then there were sudden gasps all across the stands as everyone saw Fleur's bubblehead charm shrunk dangerously close to her face, receding from below the neck level to just below the chin. Okay, I need to do something, or she's going to drown, he thought, feeling a little panicked himself, and it's going to happen in front of everyone else. Yup, 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 I should do it right now. Immediately, the water beneath his feet, which was keeping him afloat above, gave way, and he sank below without making a splash, leaving behind just a hint of a circular wave from where he was standing. On the judge's platform, Karkaroff glared at Dumbledore. Where did he go, Dumbledore? What are your students doing now? Dumbledore glanced at Karkaroff and shrugged with a hint of a smile on his face. I have no idea what he's doing. Mr. West, for the most part, likes to do things on his own, at his own pace, at his own discretion. You lie. First, you enter two champions, and now this. He hasn't done anything yet, Igor, Dumbledore pointed up at the illusion still running. Let's see what he does. I'm sure it will be entertaining, and isn't that what we are going here for? Dumbledore merrily laughed, while Karkaroff frowned deeply. Sitting by their side, Olympa's eyes were fixed with the illusion. She tapped away at the armrest of her chair, with a pit sitting in the base of her stomach. She had complete confidence in Fleur to handle herself, but that was when Fleur had a wand in her hand. Right now, she didn't have one, which in itself was the worst nightmare for a witch. I see him. I can see Mr. West, said Barty Crouch Sr., as stern as ever. He hadn't shown up at the Yule Ball or for work at the Ministry because of bad health, but he was back now, healthy as a bull. Everyone saw Quinn in the illusion, swimming towards Fleur from her backside as the artificial eye was positioned at Fleur's front. Tracy sitting in the stands nudged Astoria and whispered, it's just like the time when he came outside the common room windows. Astoria nodded as she and everyone could see that Quinn's hands and feet had gained webbing and he had gill flaps on his neck and chest. Where did he ditch his clothes? Tracy turned towards the speaker and gazed at Eddie, who was sitting beside her watching the illusion with a thoughtful look. In the illusion, Quinn was in nothing but a pair of swimming trunks. Dumbledore studied the illusion, specifically Quinn, and assessed the gills and webbed feet and hands. Those aren't from gillyweed like Mr. Potter's, then they are transfigurations. Hmm, but why does he have gills on his chest? Wait a minute, are they directly connected? Oh my, if that's the case, then that's some impressive work. Even from seeing just an image fabricated from Quinn's memory, Dumbledore could tell precisely what magic Quinn was using. Quinn shot every grindelow, trapping Fleur with jets of stunning spell directed through his fake wand. Not a single little snickering water midget was able to escape or even had a chance to escape. He came to the front and was immediately stunned. She's unconscious. He saw that her bubblehead charm was still intact but she isn't getting enough air through it. He poked his fake wand into her bubble and cast a much sturdier bubblehead charm, once again resuming an ample supply of oxygen for Fleur. Quinn grabbed her by the waist and looked up. 
He could send her back to the shore right from here, but that would attract attention, and with it suspicion. His power stint last year, which led him to split the lake, garnered a lot of attention. Students and professors alike had visited and staked the lake for weeks to figure what had happened. Dumbledore himself, at that time and when planning for the second task, had extensively investigated the abnormality. Both times, he had examined the lake for a month and talked with the merpeople. All he got from his efforts was that the giant squid, Kraken, had been active a lot, moving around, causing underwater waves, but other than that, even they didn't know the cause of the bizarre incident. Quinn knew all of this because he had chanced upon Dumbledore talking to a merperson. That very day, Quinn had gone and made sure that the entrance to the aquatic vault was hidden from sight so that if Dumbledore ever did go close to the entrance, he would miss it. Standing on the water was fine, but if he sent Fleur up from here, that would be a massive giveaway and might turn him into a prime suspect. Quinn swam up, pulling Fleur with him. He had to shoot a couple more Grendelos on the way, but otherwise, Quinn got Fleur out as soon as possible. Outside on the surface, everyone saw Quinn and Fleur pop out of the water. They watched as Quinn set Fleur flat on the water surface, as if it was solid, and himself used the lake surface to climb up before picking up Fleur in his arms and walked towards the stands. Poppy came running out on the platform from where the champions had jumped as he got close to the stands. Quinn, how's she status? She's fine, just fainted. Her bubblehead charm shrunk and couldn't provide enough air to her, replied Quinn. She'll be fine, just need to get up on her own. Okay, pass her up. She needed to check for herself just to be safe and sure. Quinn clutched his fake wand and was about to wave it in the motion for a body levitation charm, but felt Fleur's arms tighten around her neck. Quinn, he heard a soft and faint whisper. He glanced down and saw Fleur looking at him with half-lidded eyes. Yes, I'm here. Gabrielle. She's fine, he said, as unlike her, he knew that the hostages weren't in any danger. Where is she? She's fine and safe. Her eyes once again began closing, but before they fully closed, she spoke on last time. Bring her up, please. Quinn sighed as his lie failed the deception check. Yeah, I will get her up. Hmm. He sent her up to Poppy to get checked up and brought up back to health. Now it was time to get Gabriel back up. He turned around, and before the judges could say anything, Quinn sunk back in, not giving them a chance to stop them. Quinn knew that Dumbledore would call up a Merperson, who would then go back to get Gabrielle back up. While that was fine, it would take too much time. Fleur might be up and running, and if she saw her sister still missing, she would panic. As such, he wanted to get Gabrielle before Fleur woke up. Because Quinn was sure that Fleur was barely half-conscious in their conscious. Quinn cut the connection to the artificial eye, and with it, erased the illusion. He finally opened his right eye, and immediately, water around started to move, and he zapped towards the merpeople village to retrieve Gabrielle. He cut the water magic just before he was within sight and swam normally towards the statue to which Gabrielle was tied. He stepped on the lake bed and finally saw an asleep, floating Gabrielle. He walked normally as if he wasn't in the water, and when a merperson swam in his path, Quinn waved a hand, gesturing to move aside. But the merperson didn't move and stared at Quinn sternly. Maybe it was because Quinn was in a hurry or because he had so much water around him, and it felt terrific as if power was filling him that he waved his hand once again. And the merperson was swept away by an underwater wave, leaving the path free, which Quinn briskly walked to reach Gabrielle. He simply looked at the five merfolk standing nearby, and they didn't dare approach him. He untied the little villa, and just like his sister, he took off with her, this time just faster, courtesy of water magic. The merpeople could only stand and watch as Quinn left with the hostage that they had to protect. When he finally emerged, everyone screamed, cheered, and applauded as if he was a champion. Quinn stared at them with a partially surprised expression. Then his face changed from surprise to a bit of furrow in his brow, because he saw a wide-awake Fleur wrapped in towels, staring at him. No, staring at Gabrielle, who had woken up from her enchanted sleep, coming out of the water was the trigger. He walked to the champion's platform and waved his fake wand, which made the water under his rise up, 
pushing him up. He kept it pretty wobbly, just to be safe. Oh, Gabrielle. French flew out of Fleur's mouth as she received Gabrielle from Quinn and hugged her confused sister. Come here, you, said Madame Pomfrey. She took Gabrielle from Fleur and, under the watchful eye of Fleur, warmed up Gabrielle and checked if the young girl was up. A third-year Hufflepuff called out softly to Quinn and shyly handed him a towel. Quinn smiled and received it with a smile. He didn't actually need the towel, but he pretended to wipe his face as magic stipped water of from his body. He handed the towel back with a thank you, making the girl blush. He looked down, and he was still in his swim shorts, and then at the lake where he had stripped himself of his cloth in the heat of the moment. He shrugged and conjured a simple shirt around his body. Well done, Mr. West, Dumbledore cried. You brought Miss Delacour just in time, though going after Miss Ba Gabrielle was a little hasty, but I understand. Thank you, Headmaster, smiled Quinn. I was the closest. It was just natural for me to help out. He also noticed Karkaroff watching him. He was the only judge who had not left the table, the sole judge not showing signs of pleasure and relief that Fleur and Gabrielle had got back safely. Quinn smiled and nodded towards Karkaroff with a short head bow. Quinn looked back at Dumbledore just to find that the old headmaster was missing. Dumbledore was crouching at the water's edge, deep in conversation with what seemed to be the chief Merperson, a particularly wild and ferocious-looking female. He was making the same sort of screechy noises that the merpeople made when they were above water. Clearly, Dumbledore could speak mermish. Finally, he straightened up, turned to his fellow judges, and said, a conference before we give the marks, I think. The judges went into a huddle. Poppy had gone to rescue Ivy and Harry from Lily's clutches. She led him over to Daphne and the others, gave them a blanket and some pepper-up potion. Quinn had been a little too fast in his rescue. As Poppy dealt with the champions and hostages, Quinn squatted at the platform's edge and looked deeply at the lake while pointing his fake wand. A dozen seconds later, his clothes came flying out, sloshing in water, thoroughly soaking. He eh? He smiled and insta-dried his clothes. Quinn stood up and turned to see Fleur standing just behind him. Whoa! Hey, how are you feeling? He asked. The Vila threw her arms around Quinn's neck and kissed him deeply right on the lips. Quinn was so surprised that he froze for a second before he remembered that kissing felt really good, so he leaned into it and sub see Onciously, his hands went to her waist. Everyone, Everyone who could see Fleur and Quinn stared at the couple, which was a lot of people, including all on the platform, judges, champions, hostages, Poppy, and Lily. Harry, Cedric, and Crumb stared at the pair with their mouths open a little. Cedric got a jab which closed his mouth. The judges held varying expressions with Dumbledore smiling, young people. Poppy and Lily looked a bit scandalized to see blatant kissing happening in front of them. Finally, Ivy and Daphne, who were soaking wet with towels around them, stared at Quinn and Fleur. Almost immediately, Daphne's dislike of Fleur deepened a few levels. She wanted to get up and separate the two, but knew she couldn't do it. Ivy stared at them, and her mind started to play her interaction with Quinn after he saved Harry, his visit to their house, her visits to the aid office, him training them, him rejecting her and how that felt, and finally the dance she shared with him at the Yule Ball. Ivy decided that she didn't like what was happening in front of her. After a long and deep kiss, they separated, out of breath. Fleur's arms now rested on Quinn's chest as he gazed down at her, his arms still on her waist. Not going to lie, but this might be the best thing that happened to me this week, maybe even this month, and he had found the main innermost chamber of the fourth vault this month. Fleur nodded in total agreement. It was at the top for me as well. Really? Yes. So I'm definitely much better than okay, aren't I? Fleur chuckled melodiously and nodded. Yes, you're better than okay. She looked up and licked her lips. Much better than okay. Quinn beamed, feeling really happy right now, and gazed at the girls in his arms. He knew what he said about not wanting his first relationship to not be a fling, but right now, Fleur looked a little too appealing. He really wanted to kiss her again. Ahem. That fake cough broke Quinn out of his thoughts. He looked and saw Ludo Bagman looking at them. Fleur and Quinn removed their hands from each other, realizing that they had a lot of company. 
Mr. Bagman, said Quinn, you can continue for today. Please conclude the second task. Ludo nodded, knowing it was a request, even if there was a please in there. Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached our decision. Merchiftanus Mercus has told us exactly what happened at the bottom of the lake, and we also saw everything from here, so we have therefore decided to award marks out of 50 for each of the champions, as follows. Fleur Delacour, though she demonstrated excellent use of the bubblehead charm, was attacked by Grindelows as she approached her goal and failed to retrieve her hostage. We award her 25 points. Applause from the stands. I deserved zero, said Fleur, throatily, shaking her magnificent head. Cedric Diggory, who also used the bubblehead charm, was third to return with his hostage, though he returned one minute outside the time limit of an hour. Enormous cheers from the Hufflepuffs in the crowd, Quinn saw Cho give Cedric a glowing look. We, therefore, award him 41 points. Victor Crumb used an incomplete form of transfiguration, which was nevertheless effective and was second to return with his hostage. We award him 44 points. Karkaroff clapped particularly hard, looking very superior. Harry Potter used a gillyweed potion to great effect, Bagman continued. He returned first and well inside the time limit of an hour. He was the fastest and worked with the most efficiency. As such, we award him a total of 48 points. Harry looked proud, and Lily was clapping very hard. Quinn gave a glance to Bagman before stepping forward to take the last announcement for himself. The third and final task will take place at dusk on the 24th of June. The champions will be notified of what is coming precisely one month beforehand. Thank you all for your support of the champions. It's over, Quinn thought, sighing, as Madame Oth Pomfrey began herding the champions and hostages back to the castle to get into dry clothes, but then he felt arms wrap around his waist, and he looked down to see tiny silver blondes staring at him with her big blue eyes. Gabrielle, right? asked Quinn, pulling a smile. The girl nodded and spoke in a voice that Quinn thought was very lovely and cute. Thank you. You're welcome. The little girl continued to stare at Quinn for a few seconds before running away. She had said her thank you, but she feared that Quinn would get all yucky icky kissy face with her if she stayed. If Quinn knew her thoughts, he would have experienced a very happy blow. He looked at the lake and smiled. It was a good day. He didn't notice a few sets of eyes observing him with varying looks. Quinn West, MC, kissing feels really good. Fleur Delacour Vila, she failed the task, but the kiss balanced it out. Daphne Greengrass, Slytherin, hostage, doesn't like Fleur at all. Ivy Potter, Gryffindor, hostage, things are in flux. Gabrielle Delacour, Little Vila, kisses are yucky icky. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction, or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 179, Catching the Eye. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon, everytreon.com slash fictiononlyreader. The link is also in the synopsis. As the year entered March, the weather became drier, but cruel winds skinned people's hands and faces every time they went out onto the grounds. There were delays in the post because the owls kept being blown off course, which was beneficial for Magifax's sales, as they were finally picking up speed in the domestic household market after dominating the professional office market. It was a Friday morning in the Great Hall, during breakfast with the Hogwarts population, was a buzz with the morning energy. And for once, a lot of students were surprisingly reading newspapers. The second task had been an exciting event with the host walking on water, the flashy overhead live footage of underwater, and the very visible public display affection which marked the end of the second task. Every student in Hogwarts wanted to see what the papers wrote about the unique experience. As such, the students who didn't even touch newspapers, if it didn't have a juicy story, were gathered in groups, sharing the newspapers arriving at the Great Hall by the waves of daily owl raids. At the Gryffindor table, the Golden Squad sat together, leaning over a copy of today's Daily Prophet, reading the very first page that detailed the second task through very thorough, in-depth articles and photographs. It's not here, commented Ron, putting a spoonful of his breakfast in his mouth. 
How come of everything mentioned that's the only thing not photographed? Hell, this doesn't even mention the kiss in writing. Parvati Patil sitting right next to them with her bosom buddy Lavendar Brow. The chatty girls were hunched over an edition of Witch Weekly, scouring through the magazine pages with hungry eyes. It's not here. It's not possible. How is it possible for Witch Weekly not write about the kiss, said Parvati passing the magazine to Lavendar, who insisted on going through it again. Ivy repeatedly stabbed her fork into her food, restraining herself from breaking the plate as she heard everyone, everyone talking about the second task. Specifically, the end. It's not that big of a deal, she said, her tone held a hidden whiplash. They wrote about the second task. That's what they're supposed to write. I don't see a problem. You just don't get it, said Lavendar, resting her chin on her hand with a misty look in her eyes. It was so romantic, Quinn rescuing Fleur like that, with everyone seeing. She sighed a dreamy sigh. I agree with Ivy that the article should be about the tournament, said Hermione, finishing reading the page. Ivy nodded. She knew she could depend on her best friend. But with how the Daily Prophet reports, it does seem strange that they didn't mention the kiss, continued Hermione, stunning Ivy. Hermione pointed at the byline. Look, it's written by Rita Skeeter. It seems almost impossible for that vile woman to write something as sensible and unembellished as this. Even Ivy had to concede to the point about Rita Skeeter writing a good article sounded like someone was trying to pull her leg, strong enough to pull her into the ground. The truth was that despite the Vila champion kissing someone in public was a story worth for every writer in this country to have a parade day and for it not to be published seemed odd. Harry and Ivy exchanged looks. Both knew that his her twins were thinking about the reason behind this and knew that they were thinking the same thing. Not just them, all across the Great Hall, there were people who had the same thought as them. The children of prominent people, the likes of politicians, high-ranking ministry officials, wealthy business owners, noble families, the Hogwarts students who knew that they shared classrooms with a West. They had guessed the reason. Furthermore, they were convinced that their reason was correct. Ivy looked over to the Slytherin table and saw Maul, Foy, Crab, and Goyle were standing in a huddle together with Pansy Parkinson's gang of Slytherin girls. They, too, were looking over a newspaper. Beside them, though, Daphne was rubbing her temple. The newspapers might have not written about Quinn and Fleur, but they did go ham on Daphne and Crum. The person who Victor Crum missed the most, that was tabloid-worthy. Ron ran his eyes over the great hall, stopping at the Ravenclaw table. Fleur is here, but I can't see Quinn. He turned to Harry and asked with a grin, Harry, mate, go ask your mate friend Eddie, where is Quinn? Harry's brow twitched as his eyes subconsciously found Eddie Carmichael at the Ravenclaw. Ron, that little she, Harry held his tongue. Carmichael isn't my friend. Why would you even say that? You looked pretty chummy with him at the last game. I was not, snapped Harry before groaning. Harry considered Draco Malfoy to be his nemesis, but he had to admit that Eddie Carmichael came in a very close second. Harry was part of Alicia Spinett's Sonic Brooms, and last to last week, before the second task, they had a game against trolling boogies. Sonic Brooms went into the game undefeated with comfortable winning margins in their every win, but they knew that despite the one loss, trolling boogies were a dangerous team, and if they didn't play well, they, Sonic Brooms, could lose the game. And they did lose the game. Trolling Boogies was an offensive team. They had Cedric Diggory as their seeker, who had been having a fantastic season. He was the number three seeker after number one, Victor Crum, and number two, Harry Potter. This already put Trolling Boogies' offense in the top 50% of the ten teams. Next came the beaters, the defensive position of the team. But in trolling boogies, the beaters weren't more focused on keeping the bludger away from their seeker and chaser. Instead, they primarily followed an aggressive strategy of actively trying to knock the opposition players by redirecting, hurling the bludgers towards them. They were the prime example of offense is the best defense. Finally, there was the core offensive position, the chasers. And trolling boogies' chaser squad was electrifying, to say the least. Well, one chaser was electrifying enough for three people. Eddie Carmichael. 
the most entertaining player to see in the entire tournament. Eddie Carmichael was by far the best chaser in the 30 chasers playing in the tournament, and he was beating them on leaderboard stats by such margins that it wasn't even funny. Be it be assists or points, Eddie outclassed everyone. Eddie Carmichael merchandise sales came third in the entire league, only being beat by the pro who played for his country, Victor Crum, and the boy who lived, the youngest seeker to ever play in a Hogwarts game, Harry Potter, and both of them had the champion advantage. Eddie was a silent player who didn't speak much during the game, a tunnel focus vision towards victory, as some of his teammates described it. But that was it. He was only silent during the game, not so quiet before and especially after the game. After trolling boogeries, win against Sonic Brooms, Eddie had gone off. It was like he was saving it up during the game, that after the game, he had trash talk so much that Cedric had to transfigure Eddie's lips together to prevent him from speaking. But before he could do that, Eddie had talked in length, especially to Harry, that the Seeker was sure that his ears were bleeding. Hey, Quinn's here, said Ron, jutting his chin towards the door. Quinn entered the Great Hall like it was another day, strolled towards the Ravenclaw table, catching eyes as he passed through. What? thought Quinn, and looked around as his daily morning legilimency picked up surface thoughts from the few students around him. Ah, good to see. I'm not in the news. He had magifaxed first thing after the second task. It was a little, a lot, embarrassing to ask them to scrub the potential news about him kissing in public. It woo as more embarrassing to get just an okay in reply. Quinn sat down at his desk, smiling at his friends. You're late, said Marcus. Where were you? I dropped by the office. There is a potion slow brewing around the clock for two weeks now. You weren't having maybe a meeting, a tryst, a rendezvous with the very lovely Fleur Delacour, asked Eddie, a grin plastered over his face, and decided to send her first and come later by yourself to avoid suspicion. Quinn shook his head with a bit of his smile. That's an interesting theory, mate. Also, did you look those synonyms up? Oh ho, chuckled Eddie, wiggling his brows. He didn't refuse people. No, Eddie, I didn't meet with Fleur. Marcus leaned with a sparkle in his eyes and asked, Are you dating? Didn't we talk about this before, sighed Quinn. No, I'm not dating her. That was just, you know, a thank you. He had time to calm himself down, and with it, the impulse to get handy with Fleur as well. Uh-huh, sure it was, smirked Eddie. Quinn put down his knife and fork and looked at his dear friend. How are things going with a very charming Miss Tracy Davis? Eddie's ears turned red. Because from what I'm hearing, there had been some long walks by the lake, something you want to tell us, EDD. No, nothing. There's nothing. Quinn picked his knife and fork back up with a smile. I see, I see. If you say so, then I'll believe you. Yeah. Good, grinned Quinn. Oh man, this is good bacon. Scene break. There was a knock on the dungeon door. Enter, said Snape in his usual voice. The class looked around as the door opened. Karkaroff came in. Everyone watched him as he walked up towards Snape's desk. He was twisting his finger around his goatee and looking agitated. We need to talk, said Karkaroff abruptly when he, he had reached Snape. He seemed so determined that nobody should hear what he was saying that he was barely opening his lips. It was as though he were a relatively poor ventriloquist. Quinn kept his eyes on his ginger roots, listening hard. I'll talk to you after my lesson, Karkaroff, Snape muttered, but Karkaroff interrupted him. I want to talk now, while you can't slip off, Severus. You've been avoiding me. After the lesson, Snape snapped. Under the pretext of holding up a measuring cup to see if he'd poured out enough armadillo bile, Quinn sneaked a sidelong glance at the pair of them. Karkaroff looked extremely worried, and Snape looked angry. Karkaroff hovered behind Snape's desk for the rest of the double period. He seemed intent on preventing Snape from slipping away at the end of class. Quinn wanted to see what they wanted to talk about, so he put his hand into his pocket and took out his chip-listening device and stuck it near the two adults while the rest of the class moved noisily toward the door. What's so urgent? Quinn heard Snape hiss at Karkaroff. This, said Karkaroff, and Quinn stood outside the dungeon classroom, leaning against a wall so he could stay within range. Hmm, is he talking about the dark mark? thought Quinn. 
It was clear that Voldemort was back because Harry Potter was inside the Triwizard Tournament and Barty Crouch Jr. was still roaming in the Hogwarts halls. Well, said Karkaroff, do you see? It's never been this clear, never since. Put it away, snarled Snape. But you must have noticed, Karkaroff began in an agitated voice. We can talk later, Karkaroff, spat Snape. No, we have to talk now. This is important. Don't see what there is to fuss about, Igor. Severus, you cannot pretend this isn't happening. Karkaroff's voice sounded anxious and hushed, as though keen not to be overheard. It's been getting clearer and clearer for months. I am becoming seriously concerned. I can't deny it. Then flee, said Snape's voice curtly. Flee. I will make your excuses. I, however, am remaining at Hogwarts. There was a pregnant pause before Quinn heard a swivel of heels. He knew that the talk was over, so he cast an ill, illusion over himself and stood still. Karkaroff came out of the classroom and then strode out of the dungeon. He looked both worried and angry. Quinn remained still until Snape left, and even after that, he stayed there. Karkaroff's worries were reasonable as he was the one who snitched after Voldemort's fall in return for immunity for his various crimes. If and when Voldemort returned, there were fair chances that the Durmstrang headmaster would be one of the first to go. Quinn began thinking about what to do with Baby Mort, who would turn back into Voldemort by the end of this school. A turning point in the series of events that would change many things and a mark for even more things to change. Harry Potter and Voldemort either must die at the hand of the other for neither can live while the other survives, he whispered part of the prophecy that he recalled. If that's still the prophecy. The truth was that he couldn't stop the conflict between the dark faction and the light faction. Voldemort would never let go of the Potter or anyone who had opposed him during his fall, and the light faction would never let Voldemort roam around even if the Dark Lord suddenly changed his mind and became a saint. There was too much history in this country for things to go any other way. The light faction is stronger this time around. That will hopefully have some changes in the situation. He had no idea about the political situation in the original timeline, but in this timeline where the Potters were alive, the light faction was united with Dumbledore and Potters as leading figures. Plus, they have Sirius Black, meaning that figuratively, they have the Blacks behind them. Even though the once prestigious Black family now amounted to just one senior Auror, but I guess Sirius Black can dip into those family vaults of his when the times comes. The Black family might have folded upon themselves, but that didn't the money disappeared into nothingness. If Sirius Black didn't splurge and lose it all, then the vast amount of coin still laid in the Gringotts' vaults. But that went the other way around as well. Dark Faction had to pull themselves together to fight the much stronger faction, and even though they were at a disadvantage to this day, they were united enough to stand against the opposing threat. I hope they will get ready with time, muttered Quinn, as they were going to need a lot of resources if they wanted to come out of this with minimal damages. Third task, huh? June 24th was going to be an important day. With that thought, Quinn walked away, before turning around and returning. Yeah, I should probably take the transmitter chip back. Need to erase that evidence. There was a knock on the door, and with the affirmation from inside, the door opened and a figure entered the room. Ah, Wormtail, you have returned, said the shrill and squeaky voice. Wormtail, a.k.a. Pay Peter Pettigrew, the most wanted man in the British Isles, bowed his head in greeting. Yes, my lord. You're a day late, Wormtail, said Baby Mort with his menacing, deep, voidful eyes. The second task ended yesterday. So tell me, where were you? Peter didn't feel anxious or scared in the face of the homunculus who could still cast a killing curse and various other powerful, painful, malignant curses, even in this diminished form. I had to make sure that I wasn't suspected, my lord. The disguise I chose required me to stay a day outside to make sure no one felt that something was off. Hmm, the dull eyes observed Peter for a few moments before letting go. And, how was it? Has Barty been doing a good job guiding the Potter boy? We need that child to do good. Harry Potter is doing just fine. He came first in this task. It puts him first overall. He will start first in the last task. Good, good. 
How are the preparations at the preparations going at the graveyard? They're coming along. It's taking a while to gather the ingredients for the ritual. But there is no need to worry. We'll have all by the end of April. Hmm. My lord, there's one thing that might be problematic. What is it? There was something during the second task that might become a real problem. Out with it, Wormtail. It might be better if you take a look at it on your own. Baby Mort shifted in his bed and beckoned Wormtail closer. There was a wand in his hand. Show it to me, Wormtail. Show me the problem. Two pairs of eyes met, and magic flowed. There was a sharp pain inside Peter's head, but he gritted his teeth and endured. Hmm, I see, I see. Illusion magic. Fascinating, truly fascinating, commented Baby Mort. Who's this child? The child who cast this magic. Q. Quinn West, 5th Y. Year. Baby Mort stopped the strong legilimency and stared at Wormtail. From the West family? George West's family. Yes, groaned Peter rubbing his temple. George West's grandson. Quinn, West, hummed Baby Mort, replaying the scoured memory in his mind. Interesting. Get me more information about this Quinn West. There was a toothless grin on his face. Quinn West, MC. My name is West, Quinn West. Voldemort, Baby Mort, one ugly baby, one powerful ugly baby. Peter Pettigrew, Wormtail, Information Gathering. Fiction-only reader, writing addict. I know I shouldn't have posted another one, but I just couldn't stop. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction, or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis. Chapter 180, Rune Fix, West Meet Black. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon, slash patreon.com fiction only reader the link is also in the synopsis one of the best things about being in the innermost part of the underground vault was the peace in fact the entire underground vault was a delight to work in quinn didn't have to travel through potentially life-threatening dangerous trials like those inside the aquatic vault to get to the innermost region he didn't have to work with something capable of wiping his life in less than a fraction of a second like Absolute Zero, which Quinn still didn't know so much about. Finally, nothing messed with his mind and emotions, and because of that, he could work while being 100% of himself. Here there was just him and one big-ass stratum of marble waiting for Quinn to work on to repair it to its former glory, whatever it was. Quinn still had to figure out what the runes etched into the marbles did, but he was making progress. Right now, Quinn sat above the marble platform with a plethora of papers laid in front of him, spreading out and away from him as his eyes roamed on every single page visible to him. Nine layers, commented Quinn to himself. Nine layers worth of runes, every layer not just connected to its adjacent layer, but to all other eight layers. What was the creator thinking while building this? Why did he even need these many layers? To put it to comparison, Quinn's recon was a three-layer construct, Magifax was a five-layer construct. The containment and defensive mechanism that kept Absolute Zero in check was a seven-layer construction, and that was already a complicated structure. Plus, the addition of layers wasn't linear. The addition of every subsequent layer was a more significant addition than the preceding one. To see a nine-layered runic construct was something Quinn couldn't even begin thinking what it would result in, the usage when it would complete. Well. At least, I have the complete plans with me, said Quinn while looking at the papers. He had successfully figured out what the original construct was before the roof collapsed and damaged the runes. Right now, Quinn was sure that he knew all of the runes and the connection map to get the construct working. Time to get to work, he said, getting up as the papers formed a stack and floated near him. Now where to start, he hummed. He turned around on the spot to isolate a starting point, and as he did, the paper stack shuffled, bringing the relevant page to the top of the stack. All right, I will start there, he stared west, choosing to begin with his favorite direction. But first, Quinn closed his eyes and took a deep breath. When he opened his eyes, his vision had changed. Now, to Quinn, everything on the marble was divided into squares of one foot marked by red lines. Casting illusion on myself, he muttered, blinking his eyes, but the red grid remained. I'm not sure if I should like this or not. Whatever, let's get to work. 
Quinn sat down on the ground with his legs crossed. His focus was on just one box in the massive grid. Quinn placed his right hand in the middle on the marble stone with palm flat resting against the cold surface. Let's see, what do I have to do here? Quinn read the page on the top of the stack and read the detailed blueprints written on it. The magic trickled from his core through his hands into the marble, seeping into the stone. Transmutation. There were runes engraved on the marble, but they had been worn down with the passage of time and damaged from the fallen debris. Quinn's magic fixed that. The rune engraving, which looked like they had been etched with a hammer and chisel, crafted by a grandmaster, renewed their original charm and straightened out, smoothed down every surface while the cracks filled up by shifting and merging the stone together. Within a minute, the marble top had gone from ancient to something that looked it had been freshly carved. But Quinn didn't sis mile in admiration or stopped funneling his magic. Instead, he made his magic drip down deeper. As previously mentioned, there were nine layers of runes, and the carving on the surface was only layer one. Eight other layers etched inside the stone remained to be fixed and cleaned up. Ten minutes later, Quinn removed his hand and breathed out. All right, one block done. He looked around and smacked his lips together. Over a hundred more to go. From then onwards, Quinn spent two hours every day for an entire fortnight to complete the renovation of the carvings and another three days to prime the marble by imbibing it in potions and solutions to get the stone ready for conducting magic. To the worms below and birds above, thank all that this is finally ready, clapped Quinn, clenching his fist. He stood in the middle of an intricately carved, beautiful, and more importantly, clean rune structure. I should probably do one last check, he said, pushing his magic into the magic while flipping through the paper stack, which was now a file. Uh-huh, north, south, east, west, hmm, all right, checked and done. Now, let's what this actually does, smiled Quinn while humming. He looked down, watching the spot he was standing. The middle of the marble platform was rune-free, at least on the surface. This was the spot where he needed to input magic to start the magic. This one will need a lot to get this beauty up and running, he squatted down and grinned. Let's see if I can fill its appetite. While large-scale runes were more powerful, they needed a lot more juice to get working. While Quinn had time to time reached the limit of the magic, he could push out at once. He never had, not once, ever encountered a single task that would exhaust his capacity or even come close to it. It took dynamic plans that were constantly developed and updated throughout the years of daily magic usage every single day so that Quinn could exhaust his magic by the end of his day. By doing that, Quinn's magic was abundant than ever, much larger than what ordinary magicals could even imagine. Quinn had no doubt had more enormous reserves than anyone in Hogwarts and the British Isles. That included the white-bearded, half-moon glasses old man with sparkling eyes and maybe even the prime Dark Lord, who was currently stuck in a homunculus body. It was already a surprise that with his reserves, Quinn could exhaust his magic every single day. If someone saw how and how much magic Quinn used every day, they would classify him as a monster. Quinn started to discharge in waves and waves of magic. Magic comparable to rivers started hours into the marble and the runes. The white marble patterned with black splash patterns began to glow in rainbow lights. Oh, oh, it's working, smiled Quinn, but then the glow started to weaken. Huh, it's not enough. Need more? It brought a deeper grin to Quinn's face as he started to push more and more magic into the stone. It's getting stronger, and with it, the light in Quinn's eyes flickered, and soon, they were showing their purple glory. Hroom. A thrum spread from the marble into the ground, reaching every corner of the underground vault. Quinn stopped, stood up before running and jumping out from the marble stratum, and then he watched the show. Rainbow lights grew so strong that the orbs of light that Quinn cast for light disappeared within the presence of the stronger light. He had to shield his eyes from the light that was still bright, even though his eyes were closed. When the light finally subsided, Quinn opened his eyes and peeked around to observe what had happened, but nothing stood out. Did something happen? He walked to the marble stratum and touched the stone to see if he could, could diagnose the problem. Ouch! Huts! 
He pulled back his hand because the stone was skin-searing hot. Quinn looked at his hand, and he swore he could literally feel the heat from his wound travel through his body. Man, that was hot shit, he cursed, and healed his hand of the severe burn. What's the temperature on this? When Quinn checked, the stone was at room temperature. Huh? It cooled off so quickly? Hmm. Well, there were some runes in there that could be interpreted for cooling purposes. But what the hell, man, complained Quinn. Did I make a mistake somewhere? That doesn't seem likely. He went over his notes, plans, and memories, but nothing stood out to him. Does it mean that my plans are completely wrong? He questioned his entire research as he couldn't find anything that stood out. Quinn couldn't believe that he had made an error, so he started to look around and finally decided to collect samples. He collected a piece of marble, the surrounding soil, and the underground plants that had grown around the stratum. There must be some change. The tests will surely reveal something. It was getting late, and Quinn decided to end for today. He pulled on his noir gear and exited the forbidden forest with the samples in tow. He hid in an isolated and changed back into his Hogwarts uniform robes before stepping into the castle. That was a good magical workout. If there was one thing that he was satisfied with, then it was the magic exertion. Flut. Quinn turned around when he heard the flutter of a bird's wings, which was strange as he hadn't seen a bird when he passed by. Hmm. And as he had thought, there was no flying bird or even a stray bird in sight. Must have flown away. Oh boy, I'm feeling famished. I wonder what's for dinner. It was Quidditch Saturday, and another tournament game had gone by successfully. Right now, Quinn stood by the stadium exit, seeing the guests off. Mr. Zangba, the tenth time in the row, look forward to seeing you once again next week. Mrs. Van Pelt, how's your cat doing? Is she feeling any better? Ah, Mr. Rye, Strauss, I wasn't expecting you today. St. Mungo's has been keeping you busy these days, hasn't it? Tracy stood by Quinn's side and watched as he talked to anyone who made eye contact with him. Be it new or someone he already had contact with, Quinn spoke with everyone as if they were his friends. This was vital. Let's say while seeing a play, one enjoyed the beginning and the middle parts immensely, but if that end, that climax doesn't follow up after the amazing buildup, then people tend to be disappointed. It taints their view of the other fabulous experience. His tournament games were exciting, full of ups and downs, there was sufficient buildup, and with riveting endings, no need to worry about the experience. But if he did this, then everyone will remember this moment as the last memory of their visit here, and who doesn't like to be remembered. Then they will come the next week and week after that until the tournament ends. Quinn had to do this because he had started the tournament with zero cash. He had used all of the sponsorship resources in the setup. As such, to keep the tournament running week after week, Quinn needed a high attendance to keep bringing in the cash. Ah, Quinn, it has been a while. How have you been? Quinn turned to the voice and saw the entire Potter family with James Potter in the lead. The senior Auror looked satisfied and happy as he greeted Quinn. I'm doing just fine, Mr. Potter. How about you? Did you enjoy the game? It was a delight, beamed James Potter. The few tournament games he could attend were one of the few things he got to enjoy in his busy Auror life. There were perks of being a senior Auror. James could sneak out once in a while, and as Quinn's format had a limited duration, it ensured that he could return soon. Quinn nodded with a smile before greeting the rest of the family. Professor, twins, good to see that all of you're still supporting the tournament. Well, one of you plays in the tournament while the other two actively participate in betting. Lily blushed at the mention of her partaking in the school betting, while Ivy shrugged. She was turning her allowance into more spendy, money, and she liked it. Suddenly a face peeked from between James and Lily and spoke, Ah, so you're Quinn West, huh? You're the guy who kissed the villa in front of everybody. Nice. Serious, rebuked Lily. Actually, she, never mind. Yes, I'm Quinn West, and you're Sirius Black, Senior Auror. In the flesh, smiled Sirius as he stepped forward to shake hands with Quinn. It's nice to meet you, Mr. Black, said Quinn and shook hands with Sirius. Sirius looked Quinn up and down and nodded. I like you, kid. Quinn released Sirius's hand and nodded back. Okay. 
So tell me, kid, how did you bag the villa? Do you have any tips? Sirius Black dressed like an aristocratic man, but his personality was so roguish that it felt contradictory, but he could pull it together with overflowing self-confidence. Sirius, would you stop with that? exclaimed Lily. One would think that after so many years she would get used to it, but she wasn't. But Sirius ignored her and continued to gaze at Quinn with a smile. Contrary to popular belief, I'm not dating Fleur, replied Quinn. No one believed when he said that sentence. Really? said Sirius. He reached towards his back in a grabbing before he found and shoulder and pulled Ivy to the front. How about this one right here? I think one is prettier than her mum, and her mum is beautiful, you know, he pointed at Lily standing behind him. You can see it for yourself, see? The two redheads of the group started to shake. Without context, it seemed they were embarrassed, but Quinn knew the context and stepped back. Ivy whipped out her wand and straight out attacked Sirius with a stunning spell. But Sirius swatted away the spell with his suddenly out wand with flowing effortlessness. Sirius stared at Ivy and shrugged. Not my first time, little lady. Not my first time. A spell came from his back, but Sirius raised his wand and it struck an instantly conjured Protego shield. He turned back while twirling his wand and once again shrugged, this time at Lily. You're really predictable, you know. You will have to do much better if you want to hit me. You should really know that I don't go making fun of people without having the confidence to defend myself, and I'm an Auror, so it comes with the craft. Ivy made a face at Sirius with a slight blush on her face. Sirius raised his hand and poked Ivy in her nose with a smile. Boop, and grinned happily. Quinn watched Sirius Black and his first impression? He liked him. Well, it's nice to meet you, Mr. Black, but now I'll take my leave. Oh, sure, smiled Sirius. Let's catch up the next time I come to see a game. Of course. Quinn saw of the Potter family and the black tagalong, and as he turned around to also leave, he saw a black crow perched just above the stadium gate. Hmm, is that a crow or raven? It's massive, so I guess a raven. Then he walked away with the raven cawing in the background. Quinn West, MC, I can't be wrong. Serious Black, Senior Auror, I like having fun. Ivy Potter, making money, is still trying to attack a dog, fiction-only reader, author. Day four of four of end terms is over, but at the end, during the last exam, subject eight, was canceled mid-exam, one hour into the paper, 90-minute paper. The college goofed up by giving us the exact same paper as last year, which we had from our seniors. I had a five-day break from college, but now? Now I'll have to wait in tension about the reschedule. If you have any ideas regarding the magic you want to see in this fiction or want to offer some ideas regarding the progression, move on to the Discord server and blast those ideas. The link is in the synopsis.